Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of Japan Foundation's Pop Culture Series. I'm Sakuya Mio from Japan Foundation's New York office with my arts and culture team. In this episode, we will focus on a video game considered one of the greatest video games of all time, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It has been described as groundbreaking, changing how many perceive open world experiences in video games and inspiring many subsequent titles. Today, we have invited five professors researching video games to discuss the legacy of Breath of the Wild from the perspectives of video game history, ideology, psychology, gender, and music while exploring the significance and impact of the series in the gaming world. Um, actually, we still um, two more professors will coming soon, so, uh, but let me introduce all of them right now. So our first speaker, um, who is not here yet, is the Dr. Matt Barton from St. Clara State University in Minnesota. He is the author of seven books on video game history, including vintage games and vintage game consoles. He is also a producer of Matchat, a weekly YouTube program featuring interviews with video game developers and retrospectives of influential video games. Today, he will moderate and give us a short presentation about the broad history of Zelda franchise. Our second speaker is Dr. Steve Kuniak from Lock Haven University's Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program in Pennsylvania. <laughs> his, his particular areas focus are on the clinical application of geek and gaming themes. He has founded a nonprofit organization called Experience Points to further his endeavors in gaming and geek culture. Today, he will give us a short presentation about the appeal of The Legend of Zelda from the psychology perspective. Our third speaker is Dr. Rachel Hutchinson from the University of Delaware. She is the author of Japanese culture through video games and has co-edited various publications focusing on the representations of Japanese identity, including Japanese role-playing games, genre representation, and elimination in the JRPG. Today, her short presentation will cover how Breath of the Wild's ideology and messages conveys to players in the open world. Our first speaker is Dr. Wesley Bradford from the University of Louisiana. His research focuses on musical meaning and interpretation with a special interest in musical narrative. His recent projects have explored interpretive approaches to video game music. Today, he will give us a short presentation about the musical features of Breath of the Wild and how the music unveils the theme of the game. Our fifth speaker, who is also coming soon, is Dr. Sarah Stang from Brock University in Ontario, Canada. As a feminist game scholar, her research focuses on questions of representation, identity, diversity, and a social justice in game content, design, culture, and industries. She approaches her work from an intersectional feminist perspective and draws on media studies theories and methodologies. Today, her show presentation will cover the gender representations in the Legend of Zelda series. So, we will begin our program with a short pre-recorded presentation from each guest speaker. The so thanks three, which is already pre-recorded, so we can hear every panelist presentation. Is that no problem? So after their pre-recorded presentations, they will engage in a live discussion and a Q&A session. So please feel free to comment or ask questions in the live chat. Uh, while we have already received a lot of questions from registrants in advance, we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. Now let's move on to the presentation, starting with Matt. I will return later for the Q&A session. See you later. The Legend of Zelda is one of the most influential video game series of all time. It's a true cultural phenomenon right up there with Star Wars and Mickey Mouse. 
Indeed, it's done more than any other series to foster the idea of the gamer. Somebody who looks on their gaming, not as something frivolous, childish, or shameful, but rather a proud part of their identity. In almost 40 years since its debut, the games have sold millions of copies. And Breath of the Wild, the game we're here to discuss today, has sold over 24 million copies alone. And I bet there's more than a few here who bought a Switch just to be able to play it. And that, of course, is nothing new. Even when the first game was released back in 1987, it was said that if Super Mario Brothers was the reason to buy an NES, The Legend of Zelda was the reason to keep it. But what is it about it that makes it so successful? Even though Nintendo systems are usually underpowered compared to Sony's and Microsoft's, and why Breath of the Wild? What, what sets that game apart from all the other games and makes it unique and worthy of our scholarly attention and criticism? Uh, so first, some stats about uh, Zelda scholarship. Uh, Google Scholar gives 14,400 results on The Legend of Zelda, 337 of those just this year. Uh, many of those touch on topics we'll cover in this panel, including narrative ideology, music, psychology, gender, philosophy, semiotics, <laughs> the list goes on and on. Uh, the Open Access Theses and Dissertations database gives us 14 matches, uh, including Emily Ann Boyer's The Sound of Hyrule. And there are many conferences, symposia, and panels just like this one happening all over the world. Suffice it to say, if you're interested in researching and publishing on Zelda, you'll find an audience. In this introduction, I want to briefly sketch the broad history of Zelda and how we got here. My name is Dr. Matt Barton. I'm a professor of English at St. Cloud State University, where I've taught since 2005. Courses in professional writing, pop culture, and video game studies. The author of seven books on video game history, including vintage games and vintage games consoles. And I produce Matt Chat, a YouTube show where I interview game developers and review classic games like Zelda. Uh, in case you're wondering, my favorite Zelda game is Ocarina of Time. Uh, but I put my time into uh, Tears of the Kingdom as well, to the point where I'm looking for shrines and bright blue seeds <laughs> wherever I go. Uh, anyway, let's start with the first game, uh, released in the U.S. in 1987. Uh, this was at a time when most people still thought of video games in terms of the arcades. You put a quarter in a Donkey Kong, you played for a few minutes, and game over. Short bursts of excitement. <laughs> and with very few exceptions, the games for the consoles at the time, Atari VCS and television, ColecoVision, etc., they tried to imitate those arcade games and that, that experience. Uh the key to a good console is basically good at was the Donkey Kong you could play at home as good as the one at the pizza joint. Uh, and Atari and Activision and other companies continued to pump out more and more games, a lot of them bad. I've got Perina's Chase the Chuck Wagon, for example. <laughs> and in, in short, there were so many terrible games uh, that it led to a video game crash of 1983 uh, when it seemed like Video games had just been a fad. You know, this was this was Cabbage Patch dolls. You know, the, the time was over, <laughs> and stores didn't even want to uh, stock consoles anymore. Uh, so Nintendo, they had this successful system in Japan. They wanted to bring it to America. They were kind of facing this uh, situation, and so the way they worked around it uh, was by coupling the their uh, NES with a zapper gun for playing Duck Hunt and other games, uh, and also a toy robot. <laughs> uh, but everybody, you know, the kids knew once they got the system home, it was really Super Mario Brothers was the was the great thing about it. Uh, but the Legend of Zelda uh, was really unlike it was something new. It was unlike all these uh, console games of the time, much different than what you play in an arcade, even though it had some elements. Uh, for one, it was meant to be played for hours and hours, not just for a few minutes. Uh, indeed, the gold cartridge it came on included a battery. Uh, so you could save the game without having to input cumbersome codes, if you've ever had to do that. <laughs> uh, more importantly, it allowed players to explore a game world and chart progress on a maps, or on maps that you could look in the instruction manual, or more likely magazines like Nintendo Power. Uh, the story is simplistic. A young boy, Link, must rescue a princess from a villain named Ganon by assembling pieces of a mystical golden triangle called the Triforce. Now, thin as this was, it was still more narrative than you'd get uh, from those uh, arcade games we mentioned. Uh, it was designed primarily by Shigeru Miyamoto, Takashi Tezuka, uh, and, to, uh, and Takashi Tezuka. Uh, Miyamoto's been, of course, a noted designer even then. He had Super Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong to his credit. 
Uh, but both uh, Miyamoto and Tezuka, they wanted to make games that would appeal to a really broad, casual audience, not just hardcore gamers interested in cutting-edge technology and graphics. Uh, indeed, pl playing a Zelda game feels more like you're exploring a garden or a forest, and sort of that joy of exploration more than just roaming down a corridor, hacking on orcs and shooting demons. There seems to be something universal about these pleasures of wandering through these game worlds, exploring every nook and cranny, discovering surprises. I always make you feel like you're the first one that's ever found it. Later, Zelda games refined this formula. They took advantage of the greater possibilities afforded by the Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, GameCube, Wii, and now the Switch, and the handhelds as well. Uh, the Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, uh, for example, widely regarded one of the best 16-bit games of all time, the pinnacle of sprite-based graphics and two-dimensional exploration. Now, however, it's really Ocarina of Time, released in 1998, where the series really seemed to evolve into something trans that transcends video games, even, even if, though it still ranks on, uh, and it still ranks on many uh, best-of-all-time lists, best games of all time. It radically transforms Zelda by adding the third dimension. There were a lot of 3D games before this, of course, including Super Mario 64, but it's still remarkable how effectively the designers were able to make controlling Link in 3D almost as easy as it was in 2D. Uh, for example, the Z-targeting system let you stay focused on an enemy while moving around, a powerful innovation. Still, despite these technological wonders, nobody would be talking about it today if it hadn't been uh, for other factors like the world building, puzzle solving, the storytelling, and of course, the wonderful music. And the art direction doesn't really suffer as bad. Uh, or make, uh, Other 3D games that try to be more realistic <laughs> don't hold up as well as the Ocarina because of the art direction. It still looks and plays great today. Uh, and I think an Ocarina is a good metaphor for understanding Zelda. It's a humble instrument, but in the right hands, it can make some beautiful music. You can have a compelling narrative with hundreds of characters and a complex interconnecting webs of plot in <laughs> Game of Thrones or one of the later Final Fantasies. Uh, but you can also do uh, a lot with just a handful of characters and tropes used in clever and interesting ways. And this is the way of thinking that Miyamoto's mentor, Gunpei Yokoi, uh, he called it lateral thinking with withered technology. <laughs> withered or weathered you know, take your pick. Uh, and so while this strategy keeps development and hardware costs down, and I think it also encourages developers to focus on gameplay over graphics and lavish cinematics. And uh, by the way, Yokoi also created the toy, an actual physical toy called the Ultra Hand in 1966 uh, that gets some homage and Tears of the Kingdom, as you probably know. Now, we don't have time to discuss every great Zelda game, uh, and we can make a case that every Zelda game is a great game, uh, with the exception of some CDI titles we won't get into. <laughs> uh, but we'd uh, have to mention at least The Wind Waker from 2002, Twilight Princess in 2006, Skyward Sword in 2011. Uh, Wind Waker is probably best known for a cell shaded art style. Uh, Twilight Princess had a darker tone and the ability to transform into a wolf. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Uh, Skyward Sword tried to make the gameplay more immersive with motion controls via the Wii Motion Plus accessories so you could move your arms and that would move Link's sword around. Debatable uh, how much that was really a movement forward, uh, however. Uh, so that brings us finally to the Breath of the Wild, whose innovations seem to have gone over much better. Uh, the biggest change, of course, is the nonlinear structure and the open world dynamic. You're able to interact with the environment and deal with weather and physics in unprecedented ways. But as, as always, it's the uh, incredible attention to detail and it sets the game apart. I played it for hundreds of hours and never once thought, you know, this would be a great game if only it were in 4K. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it's still a, a brilliant game. It's, it's lots of fun to play and you, there's always something new to discover. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this foray into the Legend of the Legend of Zelda <laughs> and Breath of the Wild. And if there's one thing I've learned from playing this series, it's that it's dangerous to go alone. Uh, that's why I'm really looking forward to learning more about it from these panelists, who I'm sure will delve more into the narrative, ideology, social and cultural and dynamics, music, and psychology of this epic series. Thank you for your attention. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Steve Kuniak. I am an assistant professor at Commonwealth University Lock Haven. Uh, I'm also the president and founder of Experience Points, a 501c3 mental health uh, charitable organization where we look at kind of the connection between gaming and mental health, uh, produce some educational and outreach resources. Today, we're going to talk about the Legend of Zelda and Psych themes. So technically, um, I, I'm actually a PhD in counseling, uh, counselor education and supervision, but the Legend of Zelda and mental health themes did not sound as appropriate. So we're looking at the Legend of Zelda and psych themes. So let's take a look at what we got. So whenever I talk about any heroic storytelling, I have to start with uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Uh, Joseph Campbell was not a psychologist, not a mental health professional at all, but was rather a philosopher. And so Joseph Campbell uh, wrote some, some prolific books uh, the, about the hero with a thousand faces and the power of myth, really looking at the heroic archetype, the, the overarching themes of heroic storytelling, and then trying to kind of um, show us how those themes uh, incorporate into our day-to-day -day life. Um, we'll look at that here in just a moment. Campbell was pulling from uh, Carl Jung, who was a psychologist. Carl Jung um, was a protege of Freud's. Jung uh, did a lot of studying about uh, dreams and so looked at this idea that um, we all as human beings participate in what he called the collective unconscious. So when we sleep, we access the collective unconscious, which is like this repository of all human knowledge. It's all themed through imagery. Um, so we're, we have to then unpackage these archetypes to understand and gain meaning from whatever is being taught to us in the collective unconscious. So the archetypes are important ways to lead our life. And when we see things out in the real world, it helps us to unpackage the meaning in the archetypal imagery that we've uncovered in the collective unconscious. So Jung um, talked about this overarching archetypal imagery. Campbell focused this in on heroic storytelling more specifically. So when you think about similar stories, any heroes that are your favorites, we're going to talk about the Legend of Zelda here in just a moment. Think about, you know, the stories of King Arthur, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars. Uh, I put Spider-Man, even comic book heroes follow this same storytelling. Um, they're all the same. Like like I was mentioning earlier, um, uh, Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, talks about this idea that every hero throughout all of history, no matter when uh, in time, uh, and and the writers did not necessarily share notes or anything like that. Um, all heroes are the same hero. They follow the same story structure, the same design. So whether um, whether you like um, you know the stories of King Arthur or Hercules or Link and the Legend of Zelda, same story structure. They have these same archetypal uh, elements that are meant to convey messages to us, according to Campbell. Um, this is so common across all storytelling. Uh, a writer, Vogler, adopted this, this, uh, this theme for his book, uh, The Writer's Journey. If you think about other forms of storytelling, like movies, and you, you've watched a movie trailer and you thought, oh, that looks great, and then you go to watch the movie and it's not. Um, it's probably, according to what Vogler's saying, because it does not follow the same archetypal story structure. So this is something that's important to us. It's familiar to us. Um, it's, it's our preferred method for consuming heroic storytelling. Uh, so let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it through the lens of The Legend of Zelda. Uh, three acts, act one, the departure, act two, the initiation, and act three, the return. Everything starts in the ordinary world. So as I'm thinking about this, if we start at 12 o'clock there with the call to adventure, uh, think about Link in Kokiri Village or Link um, waking up on the plateau in the Breath of the Wild. This is the ordinary world. It's it's a generally safe space. It's familiar not necessarily in Breath of the Wild, not every archetype fits every design, but this is where the hero starts. There's a refusal of the call, so there's some sort of hesitation. We can't get off the plateau easily in the in, in the Breath of the Wild. In Kokiri Village, all of our friends are telling us not to go out into the rest of the world. We want to, but it's just not a good fit. Uh, it's not going to be safe. We meet a mentor. Um, in the case of Breath of the Wild, spoiler alert, we meet the king of Hyrule, who starts us off, uh, connects us to the greater world. And then we cross the threshold. So the ordinary world now shifts into the special world. 
in most Legend of Zelda stories, this is when we go out into the broader kingdom of Hyrule. The hero begins to connect to other allies, has to go through tests and trials to better themselves, and learns who the real enemies are. There's this idea of an, the approach to the inmost cave. Really, that's the hero, like if it were us, digging deep into our our inner, um, you know, our inner meaning, our core values and beliefs. The hero literally goes into caves. So if we think about Link, this is going into the dungeons, into the different temples. Um, Often there's a theme of water, which takes me back to the water temples, creating a lot of anxiety for me uh, when I play. Um, goes through all of these ordeals, eventually seizes the sword or some sort of a reward. I think very plainly in the Legend of Zelda stories, this is where we see Link pulling the master sword. Um, and then there's a road back. So the hero has to go back to the normal world in some form or fashion, bringing with them all the knowledge and, and all of the information that they got from the special world um there's this idea of resurrection it doesn't have to be a death and resurrection sort of theme it can be kind of the death of the old hero before they became a hero and the resurrection being all of this new information and this transformed actualized self that they're bringing back fits really well with the legend of zelda and particularly the cyclical journey fits really well because every time we end a new installment of the game comes out hopefully and we start all over again similar characters similar faces similar storytelling same structure so what about the zelda franchise just like i said uh, i think this is why it's so um, appealing to such a large fan base because it follows this this cyclical heroic structure that is familiar to us that is important to us if we buy into what Jung and uh, and um, Campbell said um, it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned we don't hit every point but I think the Zelda franchise does a good job of globally kind of hitting uh, the high notes let's talk really quickly about the breath of the wild what we came here for I think that video games, generally speaking, are a new form of storytelling for us. I think it's the same storytelling that we did around the campfire, in our books, you know, uh, in movies. I think this is just the next evolutionary step. So I think uh, video games are a modern interaction, it, modern iteration of this old storytelling structure. However, the next step is that it's active as opposed to passive. And so this active entertainment makes us the playable character. Um, I think where Breath of the Wild is really a next step is where um, we have this open and free roaming world structure. And so all of that is um, uh, aligned with player agency. So we can do whatever we want. And that me makes our choices all that much more important. So whereas I think video gaming generally is a next evolutionary step in storytelling. And so that active component is important. I think that the Breath of the Wild takes this further and we gain player ownership of the heroic archetype. So I think that is really why we have this next step, why the Breath of the Wild franchise is so um, so important as a next evolutionary step in storytelling. It's not just us observing Link's story, uh, as we might have seen in the past. It's not us actively playing Link's story, as we see in in the video games that we played um, overall, we get to kind of decide what Link does, how he approaches each of these trials, what friends he approaches and in what order. Um, we really um, define those steps in a new way. And so just like I have seen in my own counseling practice and in, you know, the, the lectures that I give in mental health, this idea of the individual taking ownership of their choices, adding power and emphasis to the impact of those decisions. I think that's what we're seeing here. And I think that that's why this is important. So fantastic talking to you in a short period of time. Look forward to any questions you have and uh, we'll, we'll uh, love to hear what you have to share. Thank you and um, see you all soon. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Hutchinson from the University of Delaware and I'm going to talk about observant play, colonialism in Breath of the Wild. Thank you so much to the Japan Foundation New York for having me and for hosting this event tonight. 
when Breath of the Wild came out in 2017 on the Nintendo Switch, it was praised for its complex open world, ambient environment, music and beautiful graphics. It also attracted some criticism for the lack of a playable female character and colonial ideology in the game. A few people made this interpretation, and uh, including the scholar Ricardo Quintana Vallejo, who compared the cover art of the game to this very famous painting by Caspar David Friedrich, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. And this image encapsulates the enlightenment, rationalist, <laughs> colonial ideology of going out into uncharted territory, mapping everything, mining it for resources, etc., conquering the wild. And we do certainly see a lot of similarities in the in the two images here. In this kind of ideology, you go and encounter various tribes in the uncharted territory. You help them achieve something. Uh, in the game, uh, these civilized others, as we might call them, are the Rito, Gerudo, and Zora on the left here. Uh, we have Link and Zelda in the middle, and the Goron tribe on the right. There are also another set of what we might call uncivilized others in the game, who are the monsters, Bokoblins, Moblins, and Lizalfos. So looking at the game in terms of the surface appearance, it certainly does uh, tap into this very conventional story along colonial lines. You help the good or civilized others, you kill the bad or uncivilized others, and achieve victory of light over darkness. But is every player of the game going to get this kind of colonial interpretation from it? Is this just for attentive players? And if so, how closely do we have to pay attention? And most importantly, I was wondering, how does this apply in an open world environment when you're not just following a linear structure, but you can basically go anywhere you want in the game world? And my research questions for this project were, what happens in Breath of the Wild if we only follow instructions? What are we supposed to notice in the environment? What is the game or the designers trying to tell us, in other words? So my research method was observant play. This is regarding the player's state of mind and intent during gameplay, paying very close attention to both instructions and the environment that surrounds you. It's a self-limiting tactic for gameplay in open worlds, which imposes strict rule-based limitations on movement and options. The instructions in Breath of the Wild come through the loading screen, of course, from non-player characters uh, who speak directly to us, from the Sheikah Slate, a piece of technology that Link carries around with him that carries adventure log reminders, memory photographs, and the Hyrule Compendium, and actual physical signboards in the environment. This is one of the loading screen tips on how to kill monsters effectively. And this is actually a, a photograph that I took of my Nintendo Switch and TV system with my iPhone camera. And all of these components are all extremely old now, so some of the photos will be a bit blurry. Um, but all the subsequent screenshots that you see are my own personal photographs. So you follow instructions, right? You do the tutorial, the basic backstory on the isolated plateau, and you follow the road to Kakariko Village where you meet Impa, and this is where you get the first real choices in the game. Impa gives you directions to four different kingdoms. The closest one is the Zora Kingdom in the north. Simultaneously, in Kakariko Village, you activate the Sheikah Slate, and the closest memory photograph you're supposed to find is southeast towards Faron. At the same time, the compendium lists two items that you're supposed to find, Mighty Bananas, also in Faron, and Zap Shrooms in Deep Akala. So Impa is basically sending you in two completely opposite directions. So we'll take them in turn. We'll go north first. Following the path out of the village, a man sitting on the ground directs you to a strange tower. It's a Sheikah tower, which is easily accessible. And an NPC at the top introduces the Zora Prince, Sidon. Following him, you get to the Zora Kingdom, where, surprisingly, you encounter a lot of hostility and racism from the Zora Elders. They blame Highlands, like Link, uh, for the calamity. They've been using Sheikah technology in the wrong ways. So Muzu here has no desire to speak to us. 
So this is narrative, okay? We're discovering a big backstory. There's enmity between the Zora and Hylian people. The reason is the Hylian abuse of Sheikah technology, and we brought about this huge civil war and disaster. So this brings us a lot of self-doubt. We're supposed to be the hero, and we're supposed to go and activate divine beasts and shrines and things like this and use this Sheikah technology, but apparently now we find out that's not a good thing, okay? This taps into a much wider Japanese discourse on the abuse of technology, and we can think particularly about nuclear anxiety that comes through in manga, anime, other games, films, etc. Okay, so this is me reading into uh, what I found from the narrative from my background in Japanese studies. Following instructions in the opposite direction, we go southeast to the Faron jungle. The memory photo takes us through a large gateway. We find our mighty bananas. We activate a new Sheikah tower. And at the top, you look out, and basically all you see is trees. There's nothing except this rocky outcrop in one direction with some of Zalfos dancing around some fruit on it. And this is really interesting because they don't rest. Okay, if you're observant, if you notice what's happening with the monsters in the game, um, at night they sleep. Right, they don't do the same activity non stop except for these two Lazelfos here. They did this dancing for three days when I when I stopped to watch them. Um, and so, unless you actually go over there with the paraglider, they, they don't stop. Right, this is them on the on the top left here. And what they're dancing around is durian fruit. Okay, and directly behind them are two huge statues. They look like religious statues, much like the um, statues of the goddess Hylia elsewhere in the game world. Uh, but they're not the goddess Hylia. There's something completely different. And instead of apples on the offering platter, there's durian fruit. Okay, if you offer one on the empty uh, plate at the right there, a korok will come out and give you a little reward. All right. So in the environment, if we take notice of what's happening, we discover these Lazalfos, they're sentient, right? They seem to be practicing religion in what they're doing. And this throws doubt on the whole binary system of civilized and barbarian that we've been led to believe by the loading screen and what have you. These monsters we've been taught to kill are also civilized. They have thoughts and rituals of their own. So now we have more self-doubt, okay? Um, so, from, again, from my context, uh, what did I read into this? I believe this is joining a much broader Japanese discourse on identity, self and other, and a very deep sense of unease with the double coloniality of Japan, not only occupied uh, by the West, but also as a coloniser in Asia. So what has my observant play of the game added to the colonial reading? Well, number one, we have a very complicit hero. It's not just simple. We have a question of what is civilised here and we have an ethical dilemma. Do we kill the monsters or not? Um, this is where I restarted the game and started a pacifist run. I decided, well, I'll just try and go through the game without killing any monsters at all. And actually it's much faster because you don't waste time on any battles at all. You just run past them. Um, and there's a lot of alternatives to killing in the game. Apart from two places, this is one of them in the central narrative. On the right, you have a young Goron called Yonobo in a bubble there, and you can't free him and get him to activate the divine beast for you unless you kill these two moblins here. So I didn't do that, right? And so I didn't activate the Goron divine beast, but actually you can defeat Ganon without it, just with the help of the Rito, Gerudo, and Zora. Okay. There are also a lot of alternatives to killing elsewhere in the game. Um, there's what the other one place in a side mission is uh, killing some bokoblins to retrieve Hestu's maracas for him. Okay, the only way to get Hestu's maracas is to kill bokoblins, and Hestu gives you inventory upgrades. But I found out you can also have inventory upgrades by building link a house in Hatano village and building a, a weapon repository on the wall. And I not, don't have time to go through all these things here. But there are a lot of alternatives to monster killing that give you the exact same benefits, which I thought was really interesting. 
So for me, my conclusions are I thought that pacifist play was actually encouraged by the game design. And there's a lot of ethical considerations for the player built into the game, which I thought was really interesting. And from my perspective, I believe this ideology joins a Japanese discourse on the abuse of technology and questions assumptions of civilised barbarian coloniser and colonizers that lie at the very heart of Japanese identity. So it's much more complicated, in other words, than just appropriating Western colonial rhetoric. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to get in touch with me or read more of my work, uh, here's some ideas on how to do that. Um, and here is the reference list for my talk. And thank you so much again. Hi, my name is Wesley Bradford, and I want to first thank the Japan Foundation of New York for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I also want to uh, give a special shout out to my wife, Angel, for helping with the video game capture uh, that you'll see in this presentation. Um, all the video game excerpts are caught either by myself or my wife on our own Nintendo Switch. For a more detailed discussion of Breath of the Wild's music and narrative structure, See my article, Exploring the Narrative Implications of Emerging Topics in the Legend of Zelda, in the Journal of Sound and Music and Games. It's an online journal uh, that you can find at the website in this slide. We've already heard tonight about the narrative structure and open world of Breath of the Wild, so I'm going to move straight into the musical features. In my research, I suggest that careful listening can reveal an underlying conflict in the game between technology and the natural world. In Breath of the Wild, technology can be a useful tool, think of Link's Sheikah Slate, but it can also be deadly and destructive in the wrong hands, specifically Ganon's. Tonight, I will discuss two broad categories of music that span Breath of the Wild and help to highlight this conflict. I call these styles mechanistic and nature. The defining features for mechanistic style include obscure or absent melodic content, repetition, synthetic or mechanical timbres, dissonance, and pointillism. While the nature style is defined by clear memorable melodies, pitch centricity, acoustic instrumentation, consonance, and simplicity. First, shrines. These areas are a positive incarnation of the mechanistic style. Shrines are left behind to help the player. These are technological areas accessed by Link's unique piece of technology, the Sheikah Slate, and feature this mechanistic style. Let's take a listen. This excerpt comes from late in the shrine queue. Note the electronic reverb and lack of immediate melodic ideas. You do hear an eventual bagpipe-like sound that provides melodic content, helping to highlight that the shrine is not antagonistic. The repetitive nature of the music ties into the mechanistic style, as machines can and often do repeat the same actions over and over. Next, I want to move on to a sound most of us are probably familiar with. Ah, the Corrupted Guardian. For me, these were one of the scariest enemies, especially when you happen to cross one early in the game. Important musical features of these encounters include modern instrumentation, especially the piano and the violins and the reverb, uh, dissonant chords, and a repetitive non-melodic idea through the majority of the battle. Additionally, Guardians include mechanical sound effects, again drawing attention to the fact that these are technological beings. These encounters are designed to be stressful. The music is fast, you hear the targeting system lock on and you know it's time for fight or flight. Between the benign shrines and dangerous guardian versions of the mechanistic style is one that shifts, denoting a challenge that, but not the immediate danger of the guardians. This version of the style appears in the Divine Beast. 
Here's Vaumetto. I have two clips to play and then discuss. When you first arrive on Vometo, the piano chords are similar to those heard during the Guardian battle, along with both sustained and intermittent electronic sounds, creating a sense of being in an alien place. The second video is later in the dungeon with beautiful strings playing a simple repetitive pattern in a style called minimalism. This shift in tone from the more dangerous Guardian-like music to the more mysterious Shrine-like music reflects the cleansing of malice that is integral to completing each divine beast. To summarize, the mechanistic style denotes technology that may be either hostile or simply unfamiliar, but is virtually always connected to a challenge for Link. Ironically, the modern or even futuristic sounds of the mechanistic style refer to technology of the ancient past in the game, perhaps acting as a warning against an over-reliance on technology. In contrast to the mechanistic style, much of Hyrule's soundscape displays what I call the nature style. This style is closely tied to living creatures and populated villages. Musically, the instrumentation tends to be of more traditional instruments and the melodies are more memorable, often familiar, than the mechanistic style. For the time, I will only play one example, the night version of Kakariko Village's theme. Visually, the village is distinct from the mechanistic shrines and divine beasts. The villagers live in simple homes and raise cocos, pumpkins, and carrots. Musically, Kakariko Village has a memorable tune played by the breathy shakuhachi flute. There are also simple percussion instruments that provide a wind chime-like effect. While this is only one brief example, it does illustrate the nature style's connection to the land of Hyrule and its people. By using traditional instruments that emphasize a live performer, the style contrasts with the repetitive mechanistic style. The prevalence of the nature style throughout Hyrule in areas such as the stables and the Deku tree give Link's journey purpose as he works toward to preserve the safety of the people. While the mechanistic and nature topics are distinct, there are times in Breath of the Wild that the two are mixed in an effect called troping. One example of this mixture happens when Link rides his horse undisturbed and includes a familiar tune. You'll notice that the excerpt begins with sparse piano playing in a point in a style called pointillism. But as you ride undisturbed, the violin joins playing a slow rendition of Hyrule Field, a classic melody, maybe the classic melody in the Zelda franchise. Several instances of troping occur in contexts directly connected to Link. I don't have time to get into too many details, but essentially Link's role as the hero allows him to navigate the mechanistic world of the Shrines and Guardians while ultimately remaining grounded in the living world of Breath of the Wild. Finally, I want to briefly mention two other styles from Breath of the Wild as a way to emphasize that the mechanistic nature dichotomy is not an exhaustive way to view Breath of the Wild. The character Cass shares qualities with the nature style, but his accordion tune and waltz-like triple meter set him apart from the nature style used in places like Kakariko Village. The Yiga clan, with their weird banana obsession, are certainly a challenge to Link, but are not connected to any advanced technology. And their music, accordingly, does not fit neatly into the mechanistic topic. I hope that all my examples today work together to illustrate the richness of music within Breath of the Wild, which has been continued in Tears of the Kingdom. 
at the time of this recording, I, I haven't played enough to have a definite opinion, but I'm hoping we can touch on Tears of the Kingdom in our live Q&A. Thanks again to all the viewers and the participants this evening, and a special thanks to the Japan Foundation of New York for inviting me to speak at this session. I'm looking forward to the discussion that we'll be having shortly. Thank you. This presentation is adapted from a paper in which I analyze gender representation in the Legend of Zelda series. There is so much to dig into in this series, but today I'm going to be focusing on the two main characters, Link and Zelda, and their history of androgyny, cross-dressing, and gender bending. In the lore of the Legend of Zelda series, in every age a hero arises to combat evil. This hero is always a boy named Link, which really makes you wonder why it's not called the Legend of Link. Anyway, Link is a silent protagonist, never speaking out loud, but simply grunting or shouting while combating enemies. And other than his rather minimal backstory as a reincarnation or descendant of the legendary hero, Link never has a detailed backstory within each game. By never speaking and having little backstory, Link serves as a blank slate for the player. According to Link's designer Ryuji Kobayashi, even Link's face and facial expressions are designed to be relatable. All of these factors together render the protagonist's identity as Link almost non-existent. Link is, however, an extremely recognizable figure solely because of the visual cues which inform the player that the hero is indeed another Link. As you can see, although the graphical capabilities and art style changed for each game, Link's highly recognizable design remained consistent throughout most of the series. And, importantly, Link has always been significantly less conventionally masculine or macho than the kind of video game protagonists you see in Western games. Of course, conceptualizations of masculinity, femininity, and androgyny are culturally contextual, and since I am a white Western scholar discussing how Western audiences perceive the gender design of a Japanese game character, I turn to the developers' own discussions of their design process to provide a nuanced and critical understanding of Link's design. Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto stated that Disney's Peter Pan was the inspiration for Link's character design. It's unsurprising then that Link is often portrayed as a cartoonish child, a design choice which adds to his androgyny. Not only that, but in stage productions of Peter Pan, the character was often played by a woman, thereby positioning Link in the history of gender bending, cross-dressing, and androgyny. Back during the Ocarina of Time days, I wanted Link to be gender neutral. I wanted the player to think maybe Link is a boy or a girl. If you saw Link as a guy, he'd have more of a feminine touch, or vice versa. If you related to Link as a girl, it was with more of a masculine aspect. While this seems quite progressive for the time, they still gendered Link male instead of leaving it ambiguous or making him an actually gender neutral or non-binary character. Link's feminine appearance is still very much within an acceptable normativity. He has physical features that are perceived as, as traditionally feminine, but he doesn't dress or behave in traditionally feminine ways, barring a few exceptions. So, fast forward a bit to Breath of the Wild. Given that Link's identity is so closely tied to his physical representation, as opposed to personality or anything like that, and given his androgynous design, it is perhaps no surprise that the character's slightly altered appearance during Nintendo's 2014 E3 teaser trailer for Breath of the Wild sparked heated debate among fans of the series. Venture Beat asked Legend of Zelda producer Aonuma in an interview about the altered appearance of the character, and he cryptically replied by smiling and saying, no one explicitly said that that was Link. This remark inflamed a widespread discussion among fans, some of whom proceeded to break down the trailer frame by frame to assess whether the character was male or female. There was certainly some backlash against the idea, idea of a female protagonist, whether this character was actually Princess Zelda finally being allowed to star in her own legend, or a child of Link and Zelda, or even a female incarnation of the legendary hero, fans seemed generally supportive of the bold move. After all, fans had been making Zelda playable or gender-swapping Link by modding the games for decades, not to mention the gender-swapped fan art and cosplay. Link's gender has never been overly important to the game, and since he's reborn every era anyway, why not be reborn as a woman, or even a non-binary hero? 
However, as a company, Nintendo is very traditional and has always preferred safety and reliability to anything that could be construed as controversial. It's perhaps unsurprising then that regardless of how enthusiastic many fans were about the idea of a female protagonist, and despite Aonuma's claims of wanting to shake up the conventions of the series, during the official unveiling of Breath of the Wild at E3 2016, the main character was definitively established as another male Link. In explanation for this, Aonuma claimed that it was intended as a joke, that it became a rumor and nothing more, and that he in no way had intention of leading people into believing Link was female. But I want to draw your attention to these highlighted statements from the same interview. You have to show Link when you create a trailer for a Zelda announcement, he said. A Zelda announcement. Yet Zelda was not shown at all. Only Link is essential. Only Link is the hero. Only Link is the playable protagonist. This is not her story, regardless of the title. Yet he claims he doesn't want people hung up on the way Link looks because Link represents the player. But if Link must always be male, regardless of his appearance, doesn't that imply that women players don't get to be represented? He doubled down on the point, saying that he really wanted Link to be a more gender-neutral character compared to his Twilight Princess iteration, and he wants anybody to be able to relate to the character, yet he's definitely a male. He deflects and basically blames the fans for thinking that Link could be a female, not his own vague fan baity comment. So he wants anybody to relate to Link, but refuses to make him anything but definitely male? You can ask the same questions about his hair color, or his skin color, or his eye color, his body shape, and so on. If Link represents the player, and he was designed to be relatable, yet he is always a slim, white male with light hair, then what kind of player is he relatable for? This question is especially complicated by the fact that this blonde-haired, blue-eyed white boy is designed by Japanese men, presumably for a Japanese and Western player base. Aonuma was asked by many reporters why his team decided not to make Link female. To Kotaku, he explained that since the Triforce is made up of Princess Zelda, Ganon, and Link, and since Princess Zelda is obviously female, they felt that if they made Link a female, it would mess with the balance of the Triforce. This explanation is obviously nonsensical since the Triforce being threefold is already unbalanced with two men and one woman. The Triforce, which is a sacred relic embodying the power of the three goddesses who created the realm of Hyrule, is made up of power, represented by Ganon, wisdom represented by Zelda, and courage represented by Link. By claiming that making Link a woman would unbalance the Triforce, Aonuma is implying that courage cannot be represented by a woman. And anyway, the Triforce isn't even in Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, so why does it matter at all? On top of this, Aonuma gave a very unsatisfying response as to why his team did not choose to have Zelda as the main character in Breath of the Wild. In an interview with GameSpot during E3, Aonuma explained that his team considered having Princess Zelda as the main character since it would have been simpler than making a female Link, but the idea was rejected because if we have Princess Zelda as the main character who fights, then what is Link going to do? Rather than entertain the concept of the princess rescuing Link for once, the idea of Zelda starring in her own legend was completely dismissed for fear of leaving Link with nothing to do, or worse, being disempowered or imprisoned as Zelda is in every single game, which is something I'll get to now. Just as Link is always a descendant or incarnation of the legendary hero, the Princess of the Legend of Zelda series is always a descendant or incarnation of the first Zelda, who is herself the reincarnation of a goddess. Zelda is generally the same age as Link in each installment, is almost always a princess, and generally wears a pink or pale colored dress, golden jewelry, and a tiara. Importantly, Zelda is not sexualized, so this is likely due to her perceived purity as both a princess and a goddess, and although she is occasionally a clear love interest for Link, their relationship is more often platonic. In every installment in the series, Zelda becomes a damsel in distress who needs Link to save her. Her distress always comes from some form of physical disempowerment. She's been kidnapped, imprisoned, put to sleep, cursed, turned to stone, possessed, and so on. Zelda sometimes has magical powers and occasionally fights with a bow, although these abilities are only ever used to assist Link in his battle against evil, usually at the very end of the game. 
In Breath of the Wild, Zelda is relegated to a disembodied voice encouraging and guiding Link. She also appears in Link's flashbacks as he gradually regains his memory throughout his adventure. However, obtaining those memories is not required for players to finish the game. Although her character is arguably more fully developed in Breath of the Wild than in other games in the series, the player can see her struggle to unlock her own magical abilities, for example, and live up to her destiny as an incarnation of the goddess. But the fact that she exists only in memories and as a disembodied voice means she functions merely as motivation for Link. This is particularly odd, as Zelda has been single-handedly keeping Ganon at bay for 100 years while Link slept, implying that she is an incredibly powerful sorceress. While she keeps Ganon from destroying the world, she repeatedly begs Link for help, telling him that he is Hyrule's only hope. Really, it sounds like she's been Hyrule's only hope this whole time. Over and over, Link is informed by other characters that he must fight to save Princess Zelda, that he is her only hope. Considering all the conversations regarding the possibility for Zelda to finally be the player character, this regression back to the series' traditional conventions is particularly disappointing. Link's flashbacks suggest that Zelda felt powerless and therefore frustrated at her reliance on Link as her hero. This frustration might be understandably shared by the player, especially given the more empowered versions of Princess Zelda featured in previous installments in the series. While Zelda is generally a damsel in distress, two versions of her character have managed to overcome, at least temporarily, her inevitable powerlessness by challenging her assigned gender role, Sheik and Tetra. In Ocarina of Time, Princess Zelda spends a large portion of the game disguised as the seemingly male Sheik to hide from the villainous Ganondorf who is hunting her. The mysterious Sheik covers most of his face, but with his red eyes, tanned skin, and slender yet masculine body, he is unrecognizable as Zelda. Late in the game, Sheik reveals himself to be Princess Zelda and changes back into the familiar blonde-haired, blue-eyed princess, complete with pink dress and golden tiara. Unsurprisingly, almost as soon as Zelda reveals herself, she's captured by Ganondorf, imprisoned in a crystal, and must be rescued by Link. While in disguise as a man, however, Sheik is a capable ninja-like warrior who actually adopts the role of hero by saving another princess. And Tetra debuted in Wind Waker as a rambunctious, tomboy tomboyish pirate captain with tan skin and blonde hair. Though a child, she's the fearless leader of a gang of pirates who respect her and obey her orders. She grudgingly assists Link to rescue his sister, albeit for her own reasons, but in doing so, Ganon discovers her true identity as Princess Zelda. Tetra and Link flee to the ruins of Hyrule Castle, where the King of Hyrule tells Tetra of the fate she was born into, and she is physically transformed into Zelda. This transformation happens against her will and is particularly strange. Her skin gets lighter, her hair gets longer, her pirate clothing becomes a pink dress, and she's suddenly wearing makeup and jewelry. Unsurprisingly, Tetra seems horrified and saddened by her fate, particularly because her, the power and freedom she enjoyed as Tetra is taken from her. She's forced to remain hidden in the ruins instead of journeying alongside Link because, as the king says to her, it's far too dangerous for you to join us on this task. She waves sadly at Link as he goes off to save the day. The brave and adventurous Tetra is completely gone. So while Zelda is able to gender bend her way to freedom and agency as Sheik and Tetra, inevitably she turns back into the princess and is victimized and disempowered yet again. Although this presentation isn't really about Tears of the Kingdom, I will briefly mention that Zelda is again effectively erased from the game. It's Link who's the hero, Link who must save Hyrule. The game opens with the two of them together, which gave me hope that she'd actually be in the game, maybe even a playable character, but nope. She disappears like 30 seconds into it and Link is off to explore the world. And again, finding out what happened to her is optional. Will we ever get to play as Zelda? I don't know. The tears of the kingdom are really my tears as I cry for Zelda who never gets to be the hero in her own legend. At least we can remember when she was Sheik and Tetra. And who knows, maybe one day we'll have an active heroic princess Zelda who rescues a female or even a truly non-binary Link. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope that you all enjoyed the great presentations from the panel as much as I did. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion now where we can dig more into all of those presentations and address the questions submitted from the audience. It's great to see that we had over 200 questions submitted before the panel even started, and we received those from all over the world. 
Sadly, we won't have time to get to all of them, uh, but thanks to everyone who sent them in and we'll try our best to cover as much ground as possible. Um, of course, we all want to thank the Japan Foundation New York and especially uh, Mio Sakuya, who's done so much work to make all of this possible. And you'll notice uh, that we've been joined by Dr. Sarah Stang from Brock University. Uh, hello, Sarah. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry that I missed the introductions at the beginning. I had a little bit of a minor emergency at home, but all <laughs> is well now, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Sarah Stang, and I think you just saw me talk. Uh, I'm an, an assistant professor at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, um, where I teach courses on game design. And um, my work, my scholarship, mostly focus, focuses on gender representation in video games, um, with, of course, some focus on Zelda. So I'm delighted to join this uh, awesome group of people to talk about this amazing game. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Sarah. You will notice that we are missing our moderator for tonight, Professor Matt Barton, who gave the first uh, presentation in the video. Um, so I'm going to take over uh, the moderator role and I'll be uh, using uh, Professor Barton's script, actually, that he sent out uh, to ask some of those questions. Uh, so uh, our first question that I want to start with is what makes Breath of the Wild unique from other games? This is from Carmona in the Philippines. Even though Breath of the Wild repeated elements across different games, what is it that makes it a timeless classic? And Matt Barton actually uh, provided his own answer here. <laughs> so I'll read that out. I think it's a question we can explore from multiple perspectives. Um, we can hear from each of the panelists. Um, but we think, uh, I think we can all agree the open world nature is probably the biggest factor here. Uh, something else that Matt liked was the lack of what we might call handrails or overt direction. In a lot of ways, you're just thrown into the world and you get to discover a lot of the cool stuff in there, interacting with the environment just on your own. All the Zelda games have surprises and rewards for people who really like to explore every nook and cranny but this game really takes it to the next level, he says. Um, maybe Wesley, you'd like to chime in here? Sure. Um, so obviously as a music theorist, uh, the, the musical uh, aspects are what are uh, kind of be my focus as much as possible tonight. Um, but as far as what makes Breath of the Wild unique, um, I think kind of two big things. One is uh, similar to like uh, what Matt said, is, is fewer boundaries um, just within the game world. Um, itself, um, Ocarina of Time, for instance, you know, you have specific music for all the specific areas that you go through. Uh, and in Breath of the Wild, it's uh, more uh, diffuse, I guess, right? So it's it's all over the place, um, different things. Um, you do have, and oftentimes you hear places before you see them in Breath of the Wild, which is uh, a great feature, um, in my opinion. Uh, the second thing I, I think that makes it really different is the shrines and divine beasts and instead of the big temples. I think there's a question about that later, so I won't say too much right now. Um, but in the other games in the series, you know, each temple has its specific kind of soundscape and the shrines coming back over and over and over almost make it seem like one big temple that's just been fractured into a million little pieces and it's all kind of tied together with that same theme over and over. Um, so I think that's two things that makes Breath of the Wild unique in, in from my perspective yeah i never thought about the shrines being one dungeon kind of fractured around the landscape but that's really cool um uh steve what do you think about what makes breath of the wild unique yeah so i mean the open world aspect i think is what <laughs> what we what we mostly focus on but from <laughs> like a mental health perspective um i i like the ability to sort of transfer ourselves onto the character so that's that's a big thing um, in my clinical practice area is like, what can we take from gaming and what what do we transfer into the real world? And I think from, you know, some of the hero's journey stuff that I, I like to talk about, um, we get to experience the hero's journey through storytelling in most other areas. But when we're doing it in an open world format, like you see in Breath of the Wild or, uh, you know, Tears of the Kingdom, you are you're doing all of it like you're making all of the decisions associated with the character and so as a result i think there's more player agency and so ownership that comes with those decisions and i think that's that's kind of a really interesting shift nice thanks 
Sarah, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm tempted to say that the series is more of like a timeless classic. Um, I think Breath of the Wild is a really interesting installment because it sort of shook up the conventions of the series and did things differently. But a lot of what sort of, um, uh, I don't know, what Steve is saying about being able to sort of project yourself onto the character and have a lot of freedom in how that character kind of um, goes about whatever they're doing their adventure. I think I see that in, in a lot of installments in the series. Maybe Breath of the Wild sort of took Link and made him sort of even more, I guess, again, relatable, like I talk about in my in my sort of talk you just saw. And maybe I, I also think that Breath of the Wild did a little bit more with increasing the lore and like the backstory, especially Zelda's story. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, as I sort of complained, Breath of the Wild, the memories where you see what happened with Zelda are optional. And I wish they hadn't done that. I wish they had made it mandatory content because I think that's where the game also shines for story. Zelda games aren't really known for their story, but Breath of the Wild, again, as part of their sort of shaking up the conventions, not only with the open world and the freedom and this whole kind of different different take, um, told us, showed us more Zelda, showed us more about like her emotions and her story and her experience. And it is her legend, right? It's the legend of Zelda. So I was really, really happy to see that. And I, again, like I, I'm sort of biased here in my sort of Zelda champion um, kind of uh, stance, but I really, I, I want to see more Zelda because she's the character that's fleshed out, whereas Link is yeah. the, the character you project yourself on. So along with what's been said with the freedom and the absolutely stunning open world that's been, you know, designed by Monolith yeah. Soft, who are fantastic at open worlds, I think there's a lot more sort of character development happening, not with Link, uh, because that's not a thing, but but with that, but with Zelda. And I really liked that about Breath of the Wild. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All those things all tie into it, right? And I noticed somebody in the chat, um, we haven't mentioned this yet, but someone in the chat was mentioning difficulty. And I think that does play into it as well because this is very, very um, open game to people of all kinds of levels of, of play, right? Um, because it's a very intuitive game. You can just pick it up and do it. And if something's too difficult, you can just say, oh, well, I won't do that part. And that's fine. Like, you don't need to do that part. You can just go along your way and and um, complete the game. Uh, I said in my presentation, you know, there was one, one part of the game I didn't even do. So and that was for pacifist reasons. But, you know, I still got to the end. Uh, so that's what I was going to say in, in response to that question there. Um, we have another question that I'm sure a lot of people wonder about. Um, this is from New York, New York. Why does the series keep repeating characters? For how many times we've defeated Ganon and Ganondorf, you'd think they'd try and have some new stories, they say. I know um, there are a few different ones, but the majority retread the same things over and over again. Uh, so Wesley and Sarah, I believe you have some thoughts on this. Um, sh sure, uh, I I can start. I suppose. Um, uh, short answer, I, I would say because it's myth. Um, in uh, Steve's uh, presentation tonight, he he did a, a great job of talking about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and that whole cycle. Um, and, and that go watch that part again. Um, <laughs> if you want to know why we're repeating <laughs> characters, that 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 pretty much sums it up. Um, basically, uh, the other thing I just kind of want to add to that is is repetition, ritual. It's it's a big part of what makes a myth a myth. Yeah. And uh, in Breath of the Wild in particular, um, one of the things that caught my eye or caught my, I guess, attention as I was even playing through it, again, is those shrines and their repetition, um, both in just the the aesthetics of it, the look of it, the the rooms are, you know, they're they're all different, but it's like the same construction materials, the same kind of spaces that you're in. Um, and musically, of course, it's the same soundscape mm -hmm. as I, sorry, repeating myself, but, um, sort of that mythic building upon itself over and over and over again. And that's what the series does. And I think that's why people keep coming back to the series because they have that familiar, that expectation and that sort of ritual and repetition. That's a big part of myth. And that's the legend of Zelda. Oh, thanks. 
Yeah, like absolutely agree. It's true. We've got like the archetype of the hero. We've got the archetype of the villain. We've got the archetype of the princess, right? The damsel, although she's also a goddess. So she's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. But the thing is, that's really interesting about how Breath of the Wild, again, is is sort of cha changed the vibe um, and sort of the the general formula, I guess, of Zelda games is that it, it did draw in, as Rachel was mentioning, draw in sort of um, people who maybe weren't already fans of the series um, because it had some more accessible kind of formats people might have been more interested in the open world aspect um it was a you know early title for the switch which was like a big deal console that kind of thing um but i think there is also something to say for the fandom like the the sort of you know the fandom of the series so starting out yes you have these sort of basic simple characters but as you keep playing games in the series um for me for example i played them you know every every new one that came out i was playing it even when i was little like trying to get my way through it um you get you fall in love with these characters even as blank slate archetypy as they are you really fall in love with them and you want to see what happens next and it's true that the stories are kind of basic kind of simple kind of familiar right um but the fact that you know every time you play a new zelda title you're exploring new areas of hyrule or you're seeing the gerudo from a different lens or you're you know in wind waker you meet the rito for the first time and that's really exciting um, so even though the changes between series, even before Breath of the Wild, were maybe relatively subtle, it was also from like a game design perspective, very exciting to see how they did the dungeons every time, the new sort yeah. of style. Um, and so I feel like each game in the series, even though it's so familiar and we see the same characters over and over again, by taking those like three core characters and the core world of Hyrule and like giving us more each time tidbits and more lore, more backstory, it kind of builds on itself as as a franchise and as this whole sort of like mega story um, that we've fallen in love with. Yeah. Yeah. And Steve, you told us all about the myth. Do you want to do you want to add on to anything they just said there? I don't want to, I, I feel like if I add on too much, I'm just going to waste time saying the same stuff again. I agree with it <laughs> being said, but I appreciate the, the opportunity to jump in. Okay, we'll move on then. Uh, this is a question from Chihuahua City in Mexico. How has the franchise continued to evolve as a revolutionary video game franchise for almost 40 years? It's 40 years of this franchise, right? And Matt Barton actually gave a response to this. He's our video game historian, after all. Uh, he says, I think part of the appeal is certainly owed to the popularity of the characters, uh, but it's also how well Nintendo and the Zelda designers have managed to keep what's familiar from previous games while innovating along with the consoles and handhelds from Nintendo. As one of their star franchises, along with Mario, a lot of work and attention goes into each incarnation of each game in the Zelda franchise because the games are intended not just to sell games but systems. No other developer has the insider knowledge and imperative to leverage the new tech of a system better than Nintendo's in-house teams. Ideally, there's enough value in a game like Breath of the Wild and now Tears of the Kingdom to justify buying a Switch. You can contrast that to other popular game franchises like Grand Theft Auto, which are available across multiple platforms. Um, so we also received a lot of interest in the timeline of the series and how Breath of the Wild fits into it. Um, a question from Campinas Brazil says, how is Breath of the Wild related to the other Zelda games? Um, and apart from the narrative and characters, uh, which you guys might want to um, talk more about, um, personally, uh, from my perspective, I think it follows a basic pattern of design familiarity. And I, I think that you see this in a lot of different series, right? You get the same or similar characters from game to game, similar items, place names repeating from game to game. And I'm thinking about Final Fantasy, uh, which I play a lot. Um, so you have this recurring character, Sid. Uh, you have items like very specific weapons that are always in there, uh, foods, materia, the same monsters like Cactuar and so on. Um, and in Zelda games, you always have the Master Sword, right? You've got your Gorons. Uh, you, you have milk to drink. There's always insects to catch, and you can always go fishing. Um, 
and you have similar map features. Like there's always Hyrule Plain and, and place names that sometimes serve as Easter eggs. Um, so people recognise them as familiar things from game to game. So um, from my perspective, that's how I think that Breath of the Wild is related to the other Zelda games. Um, but I'd like to open that out and see if anybody uh, has anything to say there. We already yeah, talked I, about the characters. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, like, I think we've we've touched a few, definitely a few aspects of that where they, you know, they're trying to sort of maintain this this sense of of continuity, especially in the world building. And I think that's where it really shines. Is you know, you come, especially if you're a longtime fan of the series, you're like, oh, how are we re envisioning Hyrule this time? How does how does Lake Hylia look this time? Right? How does Death Mountain look this time? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I, um, I guess I, I'll real quickly just yeah. chime in if I can. Um, musically, I think Breath of the Wild is connected very subtly to the other games in the series. Like a lot of times the thematic ideas are a lot more hidden than they were, um, which was one of the things when I very first started looking at this, when it was basically a brand new game, people were like, where, where's the music, <laughs> right? Where, where's Hyrule Field, you know? And, and so like, like I said, in my presentation, like it's something that when you're riding that horse, all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I know that. Or when you're in the castle, right? And then all of a sudden you're in, you're in Zelda's room and you start hearing Zelda's lullaby and you're like, there it is. You know, I've been looking for that. And so there are these really kind of subtle hidden connections um, that I don't know I, for me it was a great payoff like playing through the game and you get to those moments and it's just I don't know it just like really yeah. brought you back you're like oh yeah, yeah I am in Hyrule right now because I'm yeah. I'm hearing these themes and it's you know triggering all these memories yeah it's almost a physical reaction right mm -hmm. yeah. but I think that's from a from a developmental standpoint I think that those familiar underpinnings are important that aha moment that Wesley was talking about is important like that's that's almost a reward system for us so like I'm playing through this I'm playing through this I'm playing through this here's something I recognize you know and it and it brings you back so yeah. I love those nostalgia aspects I love the easter egg aspects and I think that's why it's because it reminds me that oh yes this is what I'm doing again and it takes me back to to those previous times that I was I was loving this and you know whatnot so I think it's important I, I think that is important yeah that's great. That's great. I have a very quick question from Meskisch in Germany. Who uh, Somebody wants to know where the Koroks came from, if there is any lore connected with the Koroks. Yeah, so I mean, this is a very quick answer because, like, you can look online and you will see so many fan sites dedicated to unpacking this history. But basically, they evolved from the Kokiri, who you meet in, say, Ocarina of Time, right? You you were raised uh, in the Kokiri forest under the guidance of the Great Deku Tree. And um, at first you thought you were one of the Kokiri. Turns out, no, you're actually a Hylian. Um and it's it's this is an example. It's it's a quick question with a quick answer, but it speaks to something that um, was actually in a, a previous question that I think got missed. Um, that was, does the Zelda series need to improve on how they manage the history of their games? Um, and I think that this kind of speaks to the fact that for a lot of the games, it feels like the lore, the chrono the chronology, the timeline, that's why I kind of did that in, in scare quotes, has been sort of retrofitted in after the fact, right? Um, and we have developers who have kind of, um, from Nintendo, who have kind of admitted that when they first started making the games, they had no idea of some kind of broader sort of like timeline here. Which is why it's so messy. If you buy the the sort of um, official or unofficial games that sort of go over the chronology and the split timelines, the yeah. young timeline and the adult timeline and all these things, you see that it, it kind of falls apart when you pull the threads. It's not a single tight story. It was never really intended to be. And I actually don't think it needs to be, um, especially because we do have these sort of geographical and musical and sort of like some sort of, you know, for example, in, in Breath of the Wild, you'll have areas that are named after characters you remember from Ocarina of Time, you'll have these sort of uh, nods and Easter eggs um, to the to the fandom. But once you start uh, pulling on the threads and asking the questions, like, for example, why hasn't there been another male Gerudo born since like the whole, you know, especially if you're thinking about Tears of the Kingdom, why isn't Zelda a queen instead of a princess since there's no other claimants to the throne? Like, there's like a bunch of little questions you can ask. How did the Kokiri evolve into 
uh, Korox and why? Well, apparently it's because during, you find this out during Wind Waker, the Great Flood happened and it was sort of a way for them to survive it because they could, they evolved and suddenly they could fly by sort of on their little propeller <laughs> leaf things. Yeah. Wind Waker also tells us that the Rito, the bird people evolved from the Zora, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And also later on, we have both the Zora and the Rito. Uh, yeah. So there are definitely big question marks. And I think when you try to have a coherent timeline and story and chronology, that's where it sort of falls apart. And so I think fans maybe should cool it on that or even Nintendo should cool it on trying that because it's just, it's never going to work. There are just so many plot holes and questions. Um, and it doesn't really matter, I guess, as long as you're having fun. But yeah, I think I think it does speak to that. Like the storytelling aspect of these games is the weakest aspect. Um, there's a lot going on here, but in terms of actual like story and like consistent world building and backstory and lore, it's not their strong suit. Um, which is again why I complain that what story there is in both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. It's phenomenal, especially because we explore so much more about Zelda. She becomes like an actual character, but it's optional and yeah. that's frustrating, right? That should be, yeah. it should be mandatory content because finally a Zelda games are telling a story. Right. Yeah. So thinking, thinking a little more about the Koroks. So I saw this question and I thought, oh yeah, of course, they're, they're tree spirits, right? And the fact that the great Deku tree is even in the series at all. Um, I think it also speaks to, I mean, I'm a Japanese studies person, but, uh, you know, there's very clearly some animism and and uh, the spirituality from Shinto coming into this and this idea, yes, of course, you know, a tree will have a spirit and, and there'll be little tiny tree spirits and, and it just makes sense, right? Um, and what's interesting to me uh, thinking about this is, you know, in Breath of the Wild, they say, well, the way to find the Koroks is to look for something that sticks out right, like a really big log or a pile of leaves that, that doesn't seem like it should be there. Um, it's, it's those things in nature that stick out that in Shinto would have the, you know, the little white rope around it and say, well, this is a sacred thing because it sticks out. It's something different. Um, so uh, coming at it that way as, as well, I think it makes sense with the, with the Koroks. Yeah. But Sarah, you picked up on a question uh, that was sent in that I was going to kind of um, relate to the the, uh, the next one, uh, which is, you know, complaints about the series. And somebody asked, this is a question from San Juan in the Philippines, why is Breath of the Wild divisive among longtime Zelda fans? And Matt was saying that Wesley and, and Sarah can weigh in on this. You want to go first, go Wesley? You go ahead, Sarah. I, I went first the last couple. I mean, I just I just talked a bunch about Koroks, so you can go if you'd like. No, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> so uh it was divisive, like it was, it was it was a little disappointing for me too. Now I love open world games and especially open worlds des designed by Monolith Soft because I love them. They're amazing. They make a mean open world game. So good. The fact that you could basically climb anything you could see as long as it wasn't raining. Uh, amazing. There were so many aspects to Breath of the Wild I loved. I was so excited for it. What I didn't love were the shrines. They were um, repetitive after a while. Uh, you see it again in Tears of the Kingdom. They really hold your hand. It's like a puzzle that half the time you can just throw a bomb to make the target light up instead of actually doing the trick. And even if you do the trick, you're like, I know how this works. I just have to go through the pain of actually like playing with the physics to make it happen. And this isn't fun, but I want more heart containers. So I'll do it. The Divine Beasts were really disappointing dungeons compared to, say, games that came before. Um, and from a from a game design and level design perspective, they were very, they're quite mediocre. Sorry if I'm hurting anyone's feelings if you're a huge Breath of the Wild fan. Um, but compared to older games, the level design in the dungeons, that they weren't even dungeons, the Divine Beasts um, was really disappointing, especially for longtime fans who know that the series' strength is in dungeon design. And as a, uh, someone who teaches game design, you use um, like the older Legend of Zelda games as sort of examples of how to design a, like a tight kind of space that's very heavily like thematic and has this like key ambiance and gives you sort of certain vibes around a specific object and a specific sort of feeling you want your player to have and a certain boss type. Um, and it's beautiful and brilliant. Some games better than others, some dungeons better than others. Let's not talk about the water temple in Ocarina of Time. Um, 
But in Breath of the Wild, they kind of just did away with all that. And I was, I know the whole thing was shaking up the conventions of the series. And maybe this had to do with making it more accessible. But to a lot of longtime fans, myself included, it was disappointing. The open world was great. But there was a big part of me that wished they had just come up with a new IP if they were going to change things so much Mm -hmm. instead of taking Zelda in this other direction. On the other hand, it was incredibly successful. Tears of the Kingdom, incredibly successful. So I think that pretty much all, and this might be a later question. Sorry if I'm jumping the gun, but I feel like future Zelda installments are going to be in this formula. So I think those of us who, sorry? Okay, we'll keep that one in mind. Yeah, I mean, we can we can think about it. I think what we're going to get, um, the, the only way we're going to get older, like traditional, traditional Zeldas is remakes of the older ones, which I hope they remake them all because they're all amazing. Um, so I think that if they were to take the open world and, and they did improve some dungeon, dungeon design in Tears of the Kingdom, not so much the shrines though. So I think that if they, if they keep trying to learn lessons from game design from the older games and incorporate that in the new games, we could have, we could have like a, a, a perfect package of open world, freedom of choice, exploration, also with brilliant dungeon design. They need to bring back the level designers from the older games. I don't know where they are, but they need to come back because they knew what they were doing. We're, um, we're so that's a big- We're definitely hearing you on that. Hmm? We're definitely hearing you on that, on the yeah. dungeons and the bosses. Yeah, it's, and that's the big thing that Firstly, a lot of fans talk wanna... about. Oh, sorry. Wesley, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I think short answer of why was it divisive is because it was different, which is kind of what we've been mm-hmm. been talking about for the last few minutes. It was so different um style instrumentation of music was different um there was i i, I don't recall what the uh maker of it was but there was one uh, i think it was a youtube video that was it was like is the is the music of breath of the wild good was one thing i had looked at early on like that was the that was like the headline and i was like i have to read this because i have thoughts about this um <laughs> and so essentially like it's it's so different and um sarah's talked about so many of the those aspects but i, I think it was divisive because it was different um one thing that we haven't specifically mentioned i think that was different that i personally missed was having an instrument as part of the gameplay yeah your ocarina, your harp, your wind waker baton, you know, all of those things, having that musical element, the, even howling as the wolf, right? It was a very small part in Twilight Princess, but it was still really cool. Um, just like not being able to really like do anything musical in Breath of the Wild was kind of a real disappointment. As At least not like main, there may be something that I'm like just not thinking about right now, but it wasn't like a- I guess there's the little birds thing. and you have to take them over, you know? Yeah, that's true, do, that's true. There was that side quest where you kind of had to do the song. the hole or whatever, but uh, yeah. Yeah, as opposed to a primary mechanic though, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. Uh, that's a you. really great point. I just, I, I miss that too. I don't think I realized how much I missed that until you just said that. <laughs> yeah. Um. A- a question uh so we've touched on some of the inspirations for the game a little bit in the presentations that we saw in the video um but here's a question with a specific source in mind and this comes from the united kingdom how have the films of studio ghibli impacted the story and aesthetic of both breath of the wild and more recently tears of the kingdom thank you um i had a response to this myself um, apparently in the concept art, there were notes in the margin saying Dibri, uh, just in katakana, um, you know, meaning let's let's do a Studio Ghibli kind of style here, um, which I take to mean those very lush greens, uh, the very uh, dynamic um, natural environment that, you know, the living environment that you see in, in Miyazaki Hayao's films. And I think that this shows a really deep appreciation for nature, a very deep uh, engagement uh, with the environment in Breath of the Wild that I, I hadn't seen before um, in, a, in a video game. And it even goes into things like the weather. And I could talk about the weather in Breath of the Wild for a long time, but um, I love the way the animal behaviour is tied to the weather. You know, there's certain frogs that only come out when it's raining and and things like this. And it always reminds me of my neighbour Totoro, you know, when they're at the bus stop and it's raining and then there's a big zoom in on the frog and and things like this. So I think there's a lot going on there um, with aesthetic um connections to uh, Studio Ghibli. I don't know if, if you guys have noticed uh, things of that sort. 
I just want to say that I would love a Studio Ghibli adaptation of 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 a Legend of Zelda movie. Like it would be that would be perfect. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we'll move on to uh, the characters. More about the characters. People want to know more about Link and Zelda. A question from Guelph, Ontario in Canada. What is it that makes Link an admirable protagonist? Why do find, people find him likable and at times attractive when his range of personality could be considered limited in comparison to other characters? On a similar note, we had a question from Vancouver, in British Columbia, Canada, about how Link can be so short yet so mighty. We also have one from Sao Paulo, Brazil, about how Link got his name. Um, so I, I'd like to go to Steve first uh, for a response of, about Link as the protagonist. Yeah, so initially my thoughts on this were, were pretty were pretty basic, that Link is meant to be the, uh, you know, the tabula rasa, the blank slate that we're supposed to transpose our our personality onto and so he exists just as a vessel i think in the chapter that i had written for the psychology of zelda i, I talked about link being the link between us and the game world and so i don't know i have no inner knowledge of like where that name comes from or where that is but i know i can't name my character steve in the game i always name my character link because that's that's who he is um but I had another thought as as I was kind of rewatching my own, uh, you know, my own and the rest of the the videos. I, I thought, you know, the 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 part of the question that stuck out to me was the idea of an admirable protagonist. Why is he admirable? And so I think it's because Link is a sacrificial character to us. Link serves to be this hero. We don't know anything else about Link's history. We don't know about his relationships outside the story. He doesn't have any that we're aware of. Like all of his, all of him exists based on what we do within the story. So Link is a sacrificial character and self-sacrifice is kind of a, a core archetypal, uh, you know, underpinning for what we see as an admirable trait. Um, and so I think that's why I think that Link is completely sacrificed to us. And so that is the ultimate uh, uh, admirable trait, essentially. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Other yeah, other I'll jump in. Um, I think like the the admirable, it's such a good word to use for like <laughs> admirable. That's great. Because it's, it's true. Like he's like he's heroic, sure. But he's also just like really nice and really kind and the whole thing is he just helps people no matter how small their problems are like sometimes the problems are really small and they for some reason can't solve it themselves so you're like okay I'll go you know do this thing for you even though you could literally walk five steps and do it yourself but all right <laughs> um and so I think we have a lot of a lot of video game protagonists where they help people like that's sort of it's the typical thing of being a hero but the thing is with Link possibly because he's so um blank like in terms of not having much of a personality or no backstory no um like no no personality that's like fleshed out beforehand apart from being an incarnation of the legendary hero um he he's sort of like he doesn't have ulterior motives. He doesn't have like a secret revenge quest or he doesn't have, you know, he just, he wants to help people and he wants to save Zelda. And that's just so simple that it's just, it's, it, it works for, for reinforcing how he's relatable. Right. Which, you know, as has been discussed, he was literally designed to be, to be that blank slate, even in terms of having like a very kind of not generic appearance, but like almost like a pleasing appearance. Like he has no sort of specific traits that would make him kind of like, like almost very neutral, but the neutrality, neutrality isn't a thing. Like we talk about it like it is, but it's really not. So I talk about in my work, how, you know, the fact that Link is, is relatable, but relatable to like a certain subset of hum of humanity, right? In terms of like him being white, having blonde hair, blue eyes, light-ish skin. Um, and so relatable, you know, for whom? And obviously that question is complicated because he was designed, you know, by Japanese designers, right? Um, and so there's lots of weird questions to tease out there in terms of like race and what we assume a hero looks like. But then there's also weird questions um, that we can kind of tease out in terms of that, that what was mentioned in the question in terms of attractiveness, right? Why he's so short and mighty, you know, why people kind of think of him as this like 
small little powerful package of a man and the game teases it right especially how the great fairies treat link in breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom which is <laughs> really problematic in so many ways it's, it's, it's actually kind of gross what they did there um if, mm-hmm. if any of you have played it you know what happens it's really um link gets violated again and again and again just to upgrade his armor but anyway um but they do mention like oh i would have wanted someone larger to come rescue me but i guess you'll do or like little things like oh you're so small and like and like he is tiny when you're standing next to especially the zora like when you're sp- standing next to link's canon boyfriend prince sidon uh he's like double your size you're yeah. a very small person and i think that's awesome i think it's great that he's not this like huge macho muscular kind of guy that we see in a lot of western video games anyway he's he's small but he's sort of you know he's he's strong but he's like he's doing his best you know and i think i I kind of like that that adds to his sort of relatability um and of course it's tied to his youth and his like perceived innocence and there's lots to tease out there um but i think i think it's nice to have him be be a more a, a more petite male character. Also, he looks yeah. exactly like Zelda, which is weird. You put Link in a dress and it's Zelda. I don't know. <laughs> um, I have some thoughts about the short and mighty as well. I, I think that Link is very much a, a shonen archetype, right? So this is the youth character, and we see this all the way through the JRPG. This is the hero. Um, you know, in Final Fantasy, they have the spiky hair. <laughs> Same in Dragon Quest, they have the sword, uh, etc. Um, but you know, this this shonen character that they have to be admirable, they have to be the protagonist. And and if you think about um, the context in which uh, the first game came out in the 1980s, you know, shonen jump was the biggest selling uh, comic book at the time, and and they had a formula. The winning manga narratives and it was um, you had to have three things you had to have winning you had to have friendship and you had to have perseverance and I think you know Link really fits all those things right um so yeah and the sure and then you know he has to be relatable he has to be a youth how do you show youth or well, he's shorter <laughs> um but it's it's really interesting I, I think um I I did just want to say I think yeah. I think Rachel you wanted to talk about Link's name and how uh, yeah, I was just yeah. getting to <laughs> sorry, sorry, I thought you were moving on and I wanted you to talk about that because I'm interested. Just getting to that. Um, so going back to the question from Sao Paulo and 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 Steve uh talked about this, you know, um the silent protagonist being the link between uh the player and the character. Um, I also think, you know, um the main the playable protagonist is also a link between the real world where you're sitting, like as the player right um and your game world which you're kind of thinking about and you're kind of mentally immersed in so i see link as a kind of link between your body and your mind as well in this game and you know i think um it'd be fun to think about that some more but i i think i see link as a kind of conduit um into the environment from our physical space here sitting in the living room or wherever into the environment getting into the the mood of the game um, but we, we mentioned Zelda, so we'll come back to Zelda. And Guelph Ontario also asks, how would you describe Zelda and Link's relationship? Here we go, through Breath of the Wild and other Zelda games. Do you believe it includes some kind of ethereal romance or is there just a sense of respect and platonic affection for one another? Um, also related to this, there's a question from Chihuahua City, Mexico, about Princess zelda's role as a leader in the game uh so wesley would you like to talk about romance (laughs) Um, (laughs) always no um i i I will say a kind of disclaimer like this is um pretty much my personal kind of thoughts and opinions on this like i I really haven't uh done a lot of like research or reading about this but this question i thought was interesting uh, because it's something that i i've thought about as i've played through several of these games and i think they the the game leaves it very much open to interpretation which i think is probably my my guess is that that's intentional um i think it varies from game to game um in breath of the wild like there's sort of at least some underlying one way or the other you know um I, i would say some romance um Skyward Sword, I feel like, is very, uh, they are a couple. 
Um, I think I could say that when I when I'm I just finished playing Skyward Sword in like March or something, I, I replaying that one. Um, so I think in in Skyward Sword, there's definitely romance. Like I, I think that's pretty clear because uh, you even have like the the jealous um, uh, what's his name Groot, um, right? That's like trying to always butt in the middle of it and stuff. So there's definitely <laughs> that potential there. I think in probably any of the games. Um, and but but uh, overall, I would say it's pretty ambiguous uh, and, and pretty open ended um, and open to interpretation, which could potentially be even going back to some of our early questions of why. Why is this ser series like why do we come back to the same characters? Why do we come back? Are they going to get together this time? <laughs> right. Like or or maybe you don't want them to get together this time. I don't know. But like, you know, that that could be even part of the draw of this as these yeah. two characters and their relationship like they. They're connected, right, as members of the the Triforce um, three kind of a thing. Um, so there's definitely this connection, and it's is it romantic? Sometimes is it not? Sometimes not, and back and forth, and and there there's a lot to think about there. I think it's very open ended. Yeah. Yeah, and as Sarah mentioned earlier, you know, the memories that you can access mm -hmm. in Breath of the Wild, they certainly show, uh, you know, Link and Zelda spending a lot of time together and Link heroically saving her from the Yeager and things like this. It, it plays out like a romance. It right? definitely does, for sure. Yeah. Uh, other other thoughts on this? I'll jump in that. I yeah. absolutely agree with you, Wesley, that it depends on the game. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I, I love that it's ambiguous. So some games like Skyward Sword, you mentioned, absolutely it's clear, but it, it's, but nothing's really ever shown. Maybe they hold, I think they hold hands at like the end. Um, but there's no kissing. There's no, there's nothing like super physical. Um, they're very young. And then in some of the games, they're both children, right? Like Wind Waker. And so there's nothing shown at all. Um, and in fact, Zelda's role in, in Wind Waker, it would be weird if Tetra, like suddenly was like, Ooh. um, although she is a bold forward uh, pirate captain girl. So maybe. Um, so I think, yeah, it depends on the game and the age of the characters, but regardless, they're always quite young. And I think there is this veneer of innocence. So like, there's uh, with those two specifically there's lots of older especially female characters who um are, are overtly attracted to link even when he is a child in some of the games and you see this in breath of the wild as well again with those great fairies um well it's almost like a predatory kind of desire for him and he's always like oh no uh, what are you doing <laughs> And so some people yeah. read, uh, and this might relate to later questions about queerness, but some people read Link as an asexual character um, because he does have this um, reaction to especially overt sexual, um, I guess aggression might be a strong word, but um, uh, sort of, you know, people kind of coming on to him or flirting with him with this, like, he's really embarrassed and doesn't know what to do. Um, and he's stammering, but of course is Link. So, you know, all he'd really do is stammer and, and grunt and whatever anyway. Uh, and so I think there is this sort of sheen of innocence on both him and Zelda in terms of like all things sexual. And I'm sure this might relate um, to to sort of what you were talking about, Rachel, with like the cultural context there of like the youth. Um, and uh, and I think I think it is something that they're probably going to maintain. They'll go through lots of like really serious adult kind of situations I don't think they're ever going to like officially, I don't think they're ever going to like kiss maybe on the cheek or something. I don't know, but um, it, it is, it is really interesting thinking about, uh, about them in terms of their romance as being like canonical in terms of this, like knight in shining armor and damsel in distress, but actually only ever hinted at, alluded at, teased um, or, or even just like smoothed over as like, no, they're just, they're just really good friends. Maybe someday um, okay. as you mentioned. <laughs> mm -hmm companions okay we had a question about ganondorf we haven't talked about him yet uh from tlahuac in mexico can you please talk about ganondorf and we also have a lot of general questions about gender in the game um someone in bountiful uh utah says what do you think of the somewhat unintentional queer representation breath of the wild or even the uh, zelda series of, of, as a whole um, for example, they say the person that you get the Gerudo Vi armor from, uh, they mentioned Bolson, um, Gorons in general, etc. Um, and so maybe on, on Ganondorf, we could go to Steve uh, for the villain and then just kind of open out to more general discussion. Yeah, I think 
so I was thinking about this in the last question too, about I think that Ganondorf makes a fantastic villain character because so like if you think about the archetypal hero versus the archetypal villain, he is so much the opposite of all of Link's motivations, whereas Link is completely selfless. Ganondorf is is, you know, motivated by all of all sorts of selfish, you know, um goals and things of that sort. And and even like even the way that they're depicted, you know, so we were just talking about Link being so small and Gandor Ganondorf is so big and, you know, um, Link's features are so soft and Ganondorf's features are, you know, sharper and all of these things. But so I think, I think he makes an excellent uh, foil. Even I remember getting like the Ocarina of Time toys way back. There was like a set of them. And I remember thinking that the Ganondorf figure was so much bigger than the, the Link figure that I had. Um, but it's just it's it's an excellent he is an excellent opposite and an excellent foil to link um and so that's really what i wanted to speak to from the villain perspective i know we when we were talking uh, before everything started we talked about uh the uh you know the sexy ganondorf hashtags that are trending and everything and i think that sarah can probably talk about some of that uh from a um you know from a uh, uh yeah you you can probably cover that better than i can i think right yeah, I mean, the, the internet's thirsty for Ganondorf. I think maybe after playing Tears of the Kingdom, that thirst might have died down a little bit because he's still a total jerk. And you're like, mm, that kind of makes me less. But aesthetically, he is the opposite of Link. And I think that if Link isn't your type, like if you're not into the small, cute, femme elf boy, and you're more into the giant, rock hard abs, chiseled, doesn't wear a shirt most of the time. Although that can be the case with Link too, depending on your what you wear. Um, and has those sharper features. He's also a lot darker than Link, which brings up a lot of questions about race, right? Which it, which bleeds into sort of questions about Japanese cultural context again, in terms of whiteness, blonde hair, blue eyes being associated with goodness and pureness dark hair well red hair but dark skin darker eyes being associated with evil there's a lot of problems there um but i do think that in terms of like you know the the, the thirstiness on the internet uh it, it kind of makes sense in terms of like well maybe link isn't what you're thirsty for maybe you're actually thirsty for re rehydrated uh ganondorf i think i agree he is he is a really good villain um in the sense that he's very simple again he's always just after power and it's through the context of evil right one thing I want to know, because I'm a, um, I'm also a scholar of monstrosity, uh, it's my other thing that I do, uh, is what is his relationship with the various monstrous races of the world, right? So in, um, like in Breath of the Wild a bit, and especially in Tears of the Kingdom, not too many spoilers or anything, it seems like he's sort of bringing life to the Moblins and all of these creatures, um, the Hinoxes, etc. And so it's like, are you like the father of monsters? Like, did you create all of these monsters? And if so, like, are they kind of like your children? Because normally in mythology, that's a mother figure who's like the mother of monsters, but he's like the father of monsters. And I want, I want a game, I want a game or a movie or a book or something just about Ganondorf and how he ties into Ganon and how he ties into Demise and all of that kind of stuff. So I think he's a really good villain because he's sort of fascinating and simple, or he's sort of, uh, I mean, um, sort of strong and, and aesthetically attractive, whatever, large and simple, but he's also got these fascinating layers to him, uh, which I think is is very cool. I'll quickly touch on gender and queerness. There's yeah, a lot. The queer um, aspect is, there's a lot there, isn't there's there? There's so much, yeah. Like I can't really go into it. Uh, read my writing if you're really curious and read other people's cool writing, especially on like, queerness and legend of zelda if you literally google it you'll have so many especially really good like critical analyses from fans who occupy positions like identities that they see reflected in the game um and one of them as i mentioned um reading link as asexual um reading zelda in some of her past incarnations as being gender fluid in ocarina of time she spends most of the game disguised as a man but a lot of people read her as actually gender fluid she literally transformed into a man during those times um and her disguise as tetra during wind waker she's very tomboyish she kind of floats sort of traditional gender roles 
um, there's a lot to sort of tease into there. And you can think of Link as being very like kind of effeminate and um, as I talk about a bit androgynous, masculine still and male still, but androgynous. Whereas Ganondorf is like the archetype of like extreme muscular, macho, large masculinity. So that's kind of an interesting sort of commentary there as well that like large macho is not as evil, whereas like small, petite, effeminate is good, which is there's so much to unpack there, especially Western versus Eastern kind of aesthetics. Um, some of one thing I just wanted to say before I stop is like, unfortunately, even with all of the queer potential you can read into the game, um, Nintendo has still made a lot of mistakes in terms of presenting queer characters as a joke. Um, yeah. And so that's something that is unfortunately like kind of common we see in popular culture um, where like you have the representation, but is it like good representation? Um, a lot of the time it isn't overt either. There isn't a lot of overt queerness. It's kind of veiled. Um, Nintendo is quite conservative as a company and there is still a lot of audience for like jokes, transphobic, homophobic jokes. Um, I'm hoping that that is, you know, going to be no longer the case. Uh, I think it was lessened for sure in Tears of the Kingdom. Um, and so there were definitely some some bad things that happened throughout the series in terms of um, in terms of like just just unnecessarily homo homophobic um, jokes and transphobic jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Sarah. Um, we had a lot of questions concerning the open world in Breath of the Wild. We started with this idea, but we dive a little bit further into it. Um, question from Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. Uh, somebody wants to see discussion on the art of the world's topography and how players are railroaded to complete certain objectives uh, through being drawn to multiple points of interest. Um, so I'll, I might take the topography question and, and then I'll go to Wesley as well to chime in about the role of music uh, in the environment here. Um, I think the environmental design uh, does draw the player in through their observation of uh, marked locations, obvious points of interest and so on. And the topography, I think, follows a very basic um, game design pattern of having a hot desert level, <laughs> a lush green level, a cold snowy level and so on. And this allows for a very wide range of moods and also colour palettes, right? You want to show off what the Nintendo Switch can do and you want to retain the player interest, right? So if somebody gets tired of uh, sweating in the hot desert, they can just teleport <laughs> instantly uh, to a river or a snowy place or, or something like that. Um, but this question made me think about the use of towers in the game. This is really interesting to me. Um, you know, you can see them from a long way off. Um, you, if you can make your way to one, you feel a real sense of achievement. All of them have some kind of different obstacle uh, to getting to the top, right? Um, and, and you get a reward when you finally do get to the top because you get the new map, right? And I'm, I'm not sure that I'd say that players are railroaded into um, doing things like this because it is a very open environment, as we've said, but I, I would agree that these things like the towers, the castle, the stables with smoke coming out of the top of them, um, these are places that draw the eye, right? They, they immediately signal to the player, they say to you, there's something worth checking out. Uh, so in, in, in that way, I, I think the topography is very significant in Breath of the Wild. And, and all these places are associated with music too, right, Wesley? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a, exactly right. Like, I, I would also agree that you're not really, like, railroaded per se, but I think that you're maybe encouraged sometimes um, yeah. to to go certain ways or check certain things out. Um, I, I don't know if we've talked about Cass tonight at all in Breath of the Wild, but he's one of those characters that you hear yes. and sometimes you have trouble finding, at least I, sometimes I would have trouble finding him, right? Yeah. You'd be like, where, where is he? And you're like, you're looking around and you're, you hear his little accordion going and you're like, I want, I want the next part of his tale, right? I want his story. Um, and so you hear that and that music kind of lures you in or you're looking for Kakariko village and you, you get to that shrine and you're up on that hilltop and you're like, where's now I hear it. Right. And so you, and, and you're going to that as well. So sometimes you can't see what's going because of the topo topography or whatever, but you can sometimes hear it stables also. And that was for me, um, 
always an exciting moment in the game when I'm exploring and then I would hear the stable music because it's like, oh, good, I can like go buy some food <laughs> or I can, uh, you know, sleep and re replenish my hearts or whatever the case may be. And you know that there's that comfort and that safety of that stable there. Um, and so you get sort of those musical cues and that's to say nothing about, you you know, the the actual, you know, the snowy areas or the the desert or, or whatnot, but you get musical cues throughout the game that can kind of bleed over. And even if you're not looking at something, um, the game environment as a whole um, will tell you what's going on and will give you suggestions and encouragement and kind of lead you one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you kind of feel it before you realize it. Was, oh, you feel this sense of relief. It's like, wait a minute. Oh, I'm hearing stable music. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Um, more questions about the open world. One from Quezon City in the Philippines. Is open world going to be the norm for video games now because of how much flexibility and control a player can have uh, so well demonstrated in Breath of the Wild? And I think Steve had uh, something to say here. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so, I, and Sarah brought up a really good point about this earlier. It's, I think that it will be difficult to go back but I have I have some cautions in mind with that because I I love open world games. Uh, I I'm I play far too many open world games, and I say that because I don't have enough time to play all of the open world games uh, because there's just there's too much going on and there's too much for me to explore, and then I get bored with well not bored but I get worn out from this world because I'm just digging so deep and trying to get into all this stuff, and so I switch games. And it's another open world game. I'm doing the same thing. And then I come back to the first one and I don't remember anything that I had, you know, or at least not in as great a detail as I need. I had a friend once who uh, restarted Mass Effect, the first Mass Effect, like five times, because when he kept coming <laughs> back to it, uh, he didn't remember any of the controls or any of the things that he had done before and had to start over again. Um, but so like, I have some cautions with you know, all of, I think there's a lot of free roaming that's going on out there. And I think that's fun. And I think that there's a lot of open world gameplay. And I think that's a lot of fun. And I think there's a lot of these games for service models that are out there. And I think that's a lot of fun too. But if all of the games are those things, then I'm never going to play them all. And so like, you have to, you have to consider how wide of an audience you want to reach with these things and, you know, how well you want to keep people engaged and all of those sort of things. So those are my, my cautions to it because, and I think it also like, Open world games are fun, you know, for what they are. But then when they lose their novelty, they stop being fun. And so you're also losing these other aspects of storytelling that are yeah. important in other in other types of games. Like I was playing a lot of Sea of Thieves for a while there, and I have stopped for a while. And I'm now going back and, you know, hitting my backlog and trying to get through some of my just standard story games. And those are very refreshing to like have a beginning, a middle and an end and be done with it. So, yeah. you know, so I do think we're going to see a lot more of that because it seems like that's what's popular and that's that's pushing the game engine. And that's, you know, but I but I do have some cautions with it, you know, too. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I make these decisions because I don't. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And we had another one from Manila in the Philippines. Um, how has the open world format made popular by Breath of the Wild on the Switch changed the landscape of other popular franchises within the system? And um, I, th I thought I could speak to this uh, for a minute, um, but around 2015, I think you see a lot of development into more fully open world games. Um, you know, things like Final Fantasy XII in 2006, it was kind of open world, right? Twilight Princess, the same is kind of open world. Um, but, but around 2015, you get things coming out like Metal Gear Solid V, right? Final Fantasy XV. You could really walk anywhere and do anything in those games. So a lot of it has to do, obviously, with the hardware capabilities of the new consoles. And then I think the success of these games and also the learning curve of the design teams at Nintendo has impacted the other big series at Nintendo, right? And, and we see this in the Pokemon series with Scarlet and Violet, um, for example. And, and I've just uh, been playing Scarlet uh, for another project. Um, but these games, I'm, I'm really hooked on the weather in these open world games. And Pokemon Scarlet, I noticed it has really, really impressive weather systems and you know in breath of the wild when um 
uh, sorry, my computer's doing something strange. Uh, in, in Breath of the Wild, um, if there's a big thunderstorm, right, Link will just kind of stand there and he'll get wet. But he's not worried about this. He's not perturbed in any way. His behaviour doesn't change. When there's a really big thunderstorm in uh, Pokemon Scarlet, my little character who I made to look like me kind of shrinks down and, and tries to get out of the way like this and, and you really feel like you're getting wet and you've got to get undercover right away. Um, so things like that, you know, they've taken what was in Breath of the Wild and pushed it a bit more. So I, I'm really interested to see, you know, what other kinds of things are pushed further um, because of the success of, of these games, right? Um, we we had I, I don't know if anybody else has any um, more thoughts on on uh, on open world. Go ahead, Sarah. I just wanted to say if you like the open world and the topography and everything we've been talking about with Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, check out games by Monolith Soft. I think this is the third time I've mentioned them, but they do such <laughs> amazing. They did the topography and like the, the the sort of open world design in Breath of the Wild, and they do just such amazing work. And I highly highly recommend the Xenoblade Chronicles series for its open world and exploration elements. Um, it's it's phenomenal. It's probably like one of my favorite series of all time again i'm a big like jrpg and and open world jrpg fan so yeah, yeah. right yeah, thank I'll, you I'll, for that recommendation i'll chime in too actually i just quickly um want to kind of echo i guess what uh what steve had to say about um the open world games sometimes being almost too open and especially you know having uh you know, lots of things going on. And then it's like, well, how, how much time can I invest in this? And and what do I want to do? And uh, I've also been playing um, Jedi Survivor um, this summer, which is not open world. It's a lot more kind of streamlined, but it's very, I actually, Survivor is more open world than um, Jedi Fallen Order was. But um, it's that sort of progression is, is definitely different. Um, and you still get a, a you, you still get the sense of exploring and there's a lot of nooks and crannies to look at, so to speak. But it is a lot more sort of that linear progression story wise um, with those expectations that are that are different um, between the games. And I, I think it's a, a little bit a matter of taste, um, but I, I don't know that I would say that open world is going to be the end all be all for everything um, because there are other other platform or other formats, I guess, that are also doing just as well, um, yeah. you know, financially and, and whatnot. And so I think it, it's good to keep that variety on the on the playing field. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, we're going to change tack a little bit now. Uh, this is more to do with world building, right, and and where Legend of Zelda comes from. And there's a question from Leeds in the United Kingdom. What do you think of the blend of Japanese and medieval European aesthetics in Breath of the Wild? What purpose does it serve? And Sarah has been talking a little bit about the blonde hair, blue eyes. Let's unpack this a little bit. Um, I, I'd like to speak to this a little in the context of the 1980s. I think we can understand this as um, part of the 1980s appeal of Western role-playing games and the fantasy genre more generally. Um, so we have Lincoln Zelda with the, the um, blue eyes, blonde hair. Um, you also have castles dragons, uh, European-style swords, uh, things like this. Um, and you see this a lot in Japanese media from the mid-1980s, like Dragon Quest, uh, Final Fantasy, and so on. And if we think about what else is going on in computer games at the time in Japan, this is when Wizardry and Ultima have come in to Japan. People are playing these on the PC, uh, but they're very, very difficult um, so you had a lot of uh, computer and gaming magazines explaining to people how to play these games. <laughs> uh, Koyama Yusuke has, has written about this. Um, and people writing articles in magazines about uh, even the whole concept of what role play is, what Dungeons and Dragons is and, and so forth. And at the same time, you have fantasy novels growing in popularity and competing with science fiction in the publishing world. Right. So on the one hand, I think that the blend of Japanese and medieval European aesthetics serve to kind of focus outwards and, and kind of get that global audience in to look at our stuff. Right. Um, but I also think it, it just grew out of the publishing and uh, gaming context of the time. Yeah. I don't know if uh, other people have thoughts on that. 
we're in the interest of time, we might move on. Um, the next question has connections to health and well-being. Okay, so from Edmonton in Canada, specifically for Breath of the Wild, could we maybe see some connections to health and well-being through the natural wild aspects through the game? Um, this person wrote a paper about the topic uh, not too long ago, uh, but it was hard to land, they said. I wanted to pose this question to others to hear more opinions and perspectives. Um, and I have uh, responses from Wesley and Steve, perhaps. You want to go first, Wesley? Sure. <laughs> um, I can go ahead. Um, I, I thought this was a really interesting question. Uh, I don't know that I had necessarily thought of it in quite those terms, but I think it definitely ties into what I talk about with um, the sort of this nature versus mechanical in Breath of the Wild as, you know, the 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 guardians, the divine beasts when you first meet them, um, so many things that are, are, are mechanical and that can be misused or corrupted very easily. Um, apparently uh and and get used versus the 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 natural things um that are typically more more of the safe area we've already kind of touched on the um the stables for instance and how they have that um you know the, the guitar and it's very soothing and and um when you go to Kakariko village and you hear that uh shakuhatsu hachi flute which even talk, uh, comes into the the cultural stuff that um Rachel was just talking about a little bit um, and so you hear these sort of breathy instruments, flutes and 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 plucked instruments that, you know, have very tactile human um, things in them um, when they're performed versus a, a, a piano, which obviously is also pre very performed, but much more mechanical, mechanically mm -hmm. operated. Right. You have the hammer hitting the string is how a piano makes it sound. And and when you play the keys, it's it is a mechanism that actually makes that sound instead of a like a wind instrument, like a flute where you're just using your your breath your wind um and so i i think in and this isn't something that's just in breath of the wild uh, i i do want to kind of expand that just a little bit is that in i would say kind of a lot of games in general and especially in, in nintendo games that i've looked at the more kind of mechanical electronic sounds tend to be coupled with dangerous situations or when you're doing something challenging, uh, but then you'll have the safe areas or the hub or the shops that will tend to have the more sort of natural or wild uh, instrumentation and, and types of sounds um, in kind of music theory branches. We, we get into the, the pastoral topic, which is a whole nother discussion, but um I think that this sort of idea of this health and well-being as being wild or natural and and nature being connected to safety <laughs> um, in in the game is um, yeah is something that is that I see as well yeah so I, I guess I would kind of agree with the uh, the, the question yeah yeah great Steve you want to chime in here yeah for for my part to this i think from a mental health perspective since that's what i focus on i think it's i think that open world games generally um help to reduce have the potential to reduce the anxiety associated with a game like there have been times where i've just gone into an open world style game just to kind of pass the time a little bit and to relax a little bit um i can remember for example the first time i went into minecraft when it was new and i remember going in with some of my friends and i was talking on Xbox Live to my my friend and I said, okay, so what do we do? And he said, well, you do whatever you want. And like that, that, that sort of was a, a an absolute, uh, you know, blew my mind for a moment there of like, oh, I can do anything, you know, within the scope of the game. So I think that there's something soothing about that or that has the potential to be soothing from a mental health perspective. The other thing that I wanted to point out, and I thought this was a good place to point it out, is I think that even when we talk about like the mythology of Zelda and things of that sort, the unknown is actually really important because our imaginations do a better job of capturing you know, our, our, our joy or our fear or whatever than anything that a game designer or, you know, any artist or any, anything, anyone could do. We project things uh, better for ourselves than someone could do if they actually provided it. And so I do think that, you know, this, this type of game design, this sort of loose mythology, you know, these themes that are connected, but not quite allow us a lot of opportunity to put our own spin on things. Like I think about, you know, the horror movies that have scared me the most are when I don't see the thing, you know, that that is causing the the fear. As soon as you 
create it now like i can I, I, when i was reading this question i was actually thinking of watching like the children of the corn movies and like children of the corn was terrifying to me until they showed the corn monster which was yeah. not what i thought the villain was like that's not what my imagination conjured and so all of a sudden then nothing is scary to me about this anymore so i think this open world thing is actually really important uh from that perspective where this style of tour yeah. storytelling is important from that perspective so yeah thank you for that yeah it's it's, this question i really liked this question because i also wrote a paper about um related to mental health it was more about um playing breath of the wild in the pandemic <laughs> and um be just because i spent so long playing it in lockdown and I was saying that playing the game really helped me refocus and just be in the sounds of nature not doing anything I gave up doing missions I just wanted to be there in a different space just breathing right? the breath of the world um, just being in the forest and, and just looking around and at the same time I had a very similar experience with Final Fantasy 12 which I mentioned earlier, I was playing that around the same time. And there's a jungle in, in that game and very green spaces. And um, I kind of felt like it was um, this aesthetic of forest bathing, you know, when you, you come out of it feeling better than when you went in, even if the only thing you were doing was just walking and breathing and something about that made me feel better. So, yeah, I really appreciated this question. Thank you. Um, I might, uh, we're getting to the end of our um, pre, um, pre sent uh, questions. So I'm just going to ask, I'm going to pick a few of the interesting ones at the end here. A question from Lipa City in the Philippines. How do you feel about the weapon breaking system? And I do have an answer here from um, Matt Barton, who said, I tend to find it annoying but it does give you a reason to keep collecting items and upgrading your inventory. It can also add some tension when your weapons break just at the wrong moment. I've been thinking about what it might mean for discussions of economy or perhaps the environment, or maybe even a commentary on violence or the military industrial complex. They always seem to need more money, but maybe we could do a quick poll among the panelists uh, to see if they think that weapon degradation is a plus or a minus for them. So who'd like to go first on this one? I can just say that I find it very annoying and stressful, <laughs> not because the weapon breaks, but because I compulsively want to collect every weapon and <sighs> I, I, I don't have enough space in my inventory. And so I have, like, I'll do, like, as many of the Korok seeds as I have the patience to find to upgrade my weapon inventory as high as I can so that I have enough space to keep a ridiculous number of weapons that you really don't need that many weapons. But I have so much anxiety about, like, what if I'm in a really hard battle and all of my weapons break? I'll be so ha happy that I had, you know, this huge inventory that never happens. It never, it literally never happens. So, like, in the end, it's it's more annoying for inventory management for me than it is for the fact of the weapon breaking. Um, and, and things kind of change, especially once you find the master sword. So it's kind of, but yeah, that was the yeah. the inventory issue limitations for me is, is actually more annoying. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Steve, how about you? So I find it frustrating too. From my perspective, it's, I don't need to manage another thing in this game. Like, <laughs> I like that when I, I like in previous Zelda titles, when I would find a thing, I had it and it was mine and <laughs> I could use this. And so I don't, I love that you could pick up other, other oddities and use them. And I love that you could pick up, I don't, you know, other, you know, the enemy's weapons or whatever the case may be. I thought that was kind of a clever mechanic, but I would like to have had some things that were just mine and I don't have to worry about it when I'm also making uh, all these other decisions, uh, you know, around my gameplay. So I didn't love it. Yeah. Wesley. I also didn't love it um, for but kind of the same reasons of what 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 both Steve and Sarah said. And and I would say I, I understand it um, from, I guess, like a if I'm trying to put myself in a developer perspective and, and I can understand why you would want to add that to the game. I can't say that I like it <laughs> or or that I would like want that decision to be to be made again. But it's it's very much the same sort of like it. 
kind of stresses me out. And it's one more thing I don't want to manage. And I think I would like it. I think I would have been less bothered by it if uh, Steve didn't quite say this, but but if, if it was a matter of um, there are at least some that don't break, you know, because even the Master Sword in Breath of the Wild, you get the Master Sword and then it like runs out of energy after like three hits. Charge. And yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so if there were some things, right, even if it's like later in the game, you know, and you have to deal with this breaking mechanic for a certain time and then it gets better. I would like that better, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think I'm the opposite, actually. I I like the <laughs> the weapons break. I, I find it very exciting when they break and then you get the critical hit. And I really, really like the fact that you have to go and expand your inventory, right? Because it means that I get to talk to Hestu. And I love Hestu. I love his crazy maracas. And, um, you know, I just, I just love this. And then you have to go and find more Koroks to get more seeds. And any, anything that involves the Koroks is a big plus for me. So I actually don't mind the fact that the weapons break. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more question before we go to the live uh, chat. Uh, we had questions. So this is one. I'm just going to pick the one that I thought was interesting here. Uh, we've been talking about the future of the series, right? And I, 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 People keep asking, where does it go from here, right? And we've seen some of us have played some of Tears of the Kingdom, some of us haven't. But in the future, uh, where do we think this could go? Um, and uh, specifically, there was a question from New York. New York, um, do you think we'll see any 2D titles in the future? Right? And I, I thought this was really fantastic. I think this will, there's always going to be a market for 2D games, isometric games, any kind of retro style. What I would like to see is um, maybe not a remake, but I'd like to see a new Zelda game in 2D or some really kind of retro style, but with the advanced physics and weather systems that were in Breath of the Wild. I want to see what would that look like. It's kind of hard to imagine. Um, but I want to see retro visuals with really up-to-the-minute physics. Um, uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, any any other closing thoughts on the future of Zelda before we go to the live questions? I, I think for me, I agree. I think I, I hope that we do see um, different kinds of games with different kinds of aesthetics and art styles and also play sort of like allowances for play styles. Um, I think, Steve, you mentioned that like when you go, when you're busy with an open world game, eventually you're like, okay, I'm done with this. And then you go play a different kind of game and you're like, oh, this is refreshing. And then conversely, when you play an open world game, it's refreshing. So I think that games are a beautiful medium because they offer so much like innovation and the way you design the game from aesthetics to music, to characters, to topography, whatever it is adds you know excitement and innovation and can breathe um sort of a breath of a breath of fresh air into this into this <laughs> series which I don't think will ever end I think the series will be around forever what I do want to see is related to uh character development is I want to play as Zelda I you want a game where I get to play as Zelda <laughs> I will die on this hill let me play as Zelda and then I will be happy I don't care if it's 2d or 3d or open world or linear just let me play as Zelda <laughs> nice I would say it'll go wherever they want it to go. Like they, they can do whatever they can come up with. Um, I'll yeah. second Sarah's comment though. I, I would play uh, Skyward Sword, the story of Zelda. Like you get that kind of in some flashbacks and bits and pieces. Um, I know in one of our earlier meetings uh, planning for this, we had had a little bit of that conversation, but I would absolutely play that game um, to see like her going through her challenges as as she's doing that. Um, but yeah, I think whatever they want to do, they can do it. Yeah. Great. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope we see, uh, you know, a range of different uh, different gaming methods, because like everyone's saying, I think I think that's the beauty of gaming is that it, it approaches so many different styles interest areas and and, you know, uh, personality types and all that sort of stuff. What I um, what I hope does not happen is i hope that they don't the developers don't say like oh okay this sold well let's do more of this 
to try to recapture this thing because yeah. that almost never works that's that's one of the reasons why sequels aren't typically as good as the original is because you're trying to capture lightning in a bottle again and it's it's not that it's not doing the same thing again or more or whatever it's i hope that this whatever you're trying to accomplish you're using the medium to its best standard to accomplish that task um yeah. so yeah thank you i think i think they did manage to capture lightning in a bottle with tears of the kingdom which we'll probably talk about in the live questions but i'm hoping they don't try to do it a third time because i think you're right that like <laughs> like twice is already amazing that they managed to do that let's try something maybe different for the next one guys <laughs> yeah yeah so again everybody i'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of the questions but thanks so much for sending those in and i hope that we at least touched on your topics uh now we'd like to turn it over to sakuya for some live questions from the chat hi everyone i'm back so audiences is Thank you so much for your wonderful questions from the all over the world. And then particularly, I would love, love to see there are so many fans um, from Brazil. Um, but anyway, I would like to pick up some questions from live chat. And the first one is about uh, the technology in the Breath of the Wild and Tears of Kingdom. So I'd like to ask, what is the significance of the abuse of technology theme in Breath of the Wild versus the comparative polyvalence of technology, like fusions, constructs, et cetera, in Tears of the Kingdom? Okay, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Can I, can I pick up on this one? Because I, I was arguing in my video presentation about, you know, that a lot of the uh, narrative in Breath of the Wild has to do with the abuse of technology and how, you know, maybe we get this doubt in our mind, maybe the Shika technology isn't so good, you know, maybe we shouldn't be waking up these divine beasts and opening all these shrines. We're kind of worried about it, right? Um, but you're right. Um, I, I like this question. There is a great prevalence of technology in Tears of the Kingdom. Um, and I haven't played a lot of the new game, uh, so I can't really get too far into that. But I'm waiting to see if there's any negative connections to that. Like I'm kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop because I'm enjoying using this hand and things like this. But um, I know that you have to use up Zonai charges, right, to use a lot of the machines and things in the game. And you can also mine these things right um so i'm wondering whether there's going to be any commentary on the use of resources and and stuff like that um so that would be my very brief answer to that yeah I, if i can jump in here too uh because that was kind of one of my underlying things that i talked about a lot that you hear musically as well as a sort of again, the, the mechanistic versus natural kinds of things. Um, and that was definitely a big part of Breath of the Wild um, with everything being corrupted. And uh, it was all like you're, a lot of the scariest enemies were, were, the, were the, the mechanical ones. Um, what I have played of Tears of the Kingdom, uh, that that theme doesn't seem to be continued, at least not in the same way. Um, I, I like what you said about the uh, resource management, though, as part of it, uh, because you have to, and th these are not the, the Zonai charges, at least so far. Again, I, I haven't played super, super far into it, but the, they're not dime a dozen. Right. You're not just coming across these every 10 feet or anything like uh, I've seen some, you know, uh, uh, reels and uh, YouTube videos and whatnot of people with, you know, the batteries all the way across the bottom of the screen that they're doing these like massive, amazing constructions. And I'm like, how much time did you spend just to get all of the the charges to run these things? Um, and so, yeah, I think there's there's a different kind of commentary going on here, maybe. And I think um, musically, the shrine music is also different enough, like you get, uh, especially upon completion of the shrines, um, you get sort of this choral sound and a very sort of ethereal sound. Um, and rather than sort of that desiccated body that was in the Breath of the Wild, you've got sort of these statues of uh, of the Zonai and whatnot. And so it's very, I don't know, it's, it's a different, a very different relationship with technology in this game um, and, and how that sounds. And I, I don't know that I have a full formed opinion on that yet, uh, but I think... I think it's a, a, a good observation uh, that there's definitely a, a difference uh, between the two. 
Yeah, yeah thank you. I'll follow up on that. I have finished Tears of the Kingdom, but I won't spoil <laughs> anything or anything like that. Um, so I agree, Rachel, that your point about um, mining and resource extraction is really on point. The game doesn't criti criticize that at all. So I would love to see some scholarly or critical work come out that like critiques the aspect, this aspect of resource extraction, um, along with all the other aspects of these games that sort of create this like nature versus culture and sort of exploitative, extractive kind of relationship. Because I think there's a lot of work for some some critical work there, a lot of room for some critical work there. I do recommend as you continue playing through Tears of the Kingdom to pay attention to what the Yiga clan are doing because their relationship with the technology is kind of demonstrates how this technology is by itself maybe a, maybe neutral right you you know it's just a tool but the way it's used can be used for evil even in very creative and exciting and sometimes funny ways so really pay attention to the Yiga clan uh, you find them in the depths Thank you. So next question is also re um, related to the Rachel's um, presentation, but there was a question about, I wonder how the product text, like a strategy guides, manuals, etc., surrounding the series describes the monsters in a game. Um, and then there is a, in some like a great comments um, about a, to, to your presentation um, thing. I, I also like to point out that our uncivilized also have a military ranking as mentioned on the slates scatters around the Zora, which means they are sentient, sentient enough to have some form of order. And an, another comment says, the point of con colonization is really interesting and that much more complicated when you realize that monsters are essentially the colonizers and have invaded and established settlements. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, one comment would be just the, um, oh, what's the word I want? How, um, how advanced the monster settlements are, especially if you look at the Lozalfos as well. And I think, again, you know, the Lozalfos are the ones with the big uh, statues and everything in their environment. They've got these incredible settlements with the, the bones and they've got lanterns hanging and all kinds of food and everything like that. And they're um, very technically com competent, right? And I really appreciated these comments in the chat about the military um, order um, and I have not uh, achieved 100% completion on Breath of the Wild by any means. I've been playing it for six years. And this is like the depth of this game, right? There's just more and more um, content in there. Um, but now I have to go back to the Zora Kingdom and start looking more at the, um, the, the slates uh, that you mentioned that are scattered around there uh, to find out more about uh, the monsters. Um, as for the paratext, my study did not include um, strategy, the strategy guide um, descriptions and things like that. I was just kind of looking more at like when you're playing the game, what kind of instructions come up on the screen. So I was really interested in like the loading screen and what they tell you about monsters there, which is basically kill them <laughs> in all these different ways. Um, but that's a great, that's a fantastic research topic. I would like to read about that all the uh, paratextual descriptions of monsters in Breath of the Wild. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so next, I just wanted to okay. say that, Rachel, you and I need to write a paper on the monsters uh, and, and all of this stuff because we both wear the, the monster studies teratology hats and it's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. So questions to um, Steve? I got you touch up on this like a little bit in a discussion, but uh, has, has have you ever seen therapeutic uses for games like a Breath of the Wild? Yeah, um, so I that's kind of how I cut my teeth uh, getting out of my master's program and and you know working towards my license and everything like that was I. Um, without getting into significant detail on it, I was in a really serious car accident when I was getting out of college and heading into my master's program, shattered my right leg and all that. And so I used games to kind of manage, you know, like through that healing process and everything. And so it really sparked my interest in how gaming could be helpful to people. And so the whole like, 
you know, the creation of Experience Points, which is the 501c3 charitable organization that I've started up and I'm, I'm trying to put more content out there. So like, um, you know, shameless plug, if, if you're curious about the topic, I, I try to put resources out there for uh, gaming related and geek themed, uh, but mostly gaming uh, and mental health related um, uses. I've used games in my counseling sessions with my clients. Um, sometimes it's what they bring in. Sometimes it's, hey, you know, your story is reminding me of this thing. Have you did this or are you familiar with this or whatever the case may be uh, my client base when i was when my private practice was larger I, I do a lot more with academia now so i don't i don't have as many clients uh, on my caseload but when i when i was drawing in a lot of clients it was either gamers who wanted to come to me because i would understand or parents who were referring their kids to me because they wanted me to fix them and so i did a lot of per parent education around this stuff and like how this is actually helpful and what they might, you know, what their their kids might be benefiting from from this stuff. And so and the gamers who came to me, it was more like, let's let's talk about why this is useful for you and, and what's important about this. So I could talk. I, I do lectures about this. I get contracted with different organizations to talk about these tie ins. So I could talk for a while about the topic. But the short answer is yes, and that it is very powerful and that at minimum, it is a great way to connect um, with people and to use similar language with people uh, and at maximum there's some great healing value in it so yes to all of that yeah thank you so much sure um so and then qu question about gender um there were so many questions about our uh, gender but uh let me pick up one of them so was wondering what was your thoughts were on a somewhat androgynous gender presentation of supporting characters such as Tingle, who is curiously absent in Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a lot to say about Tingle specifically. Um, Tingle has this sort of like fraught history. Um, for those of you who don't know, he's a man, a grown man who thinks he's a fairy, um, thinks he's a forest fairy, and he dresses in a green skin tight suit, and he's pretty much played for laughs, and, and he's heavily coded as queer in some way, neurodivergent for sure, um, and is is kind of the butt of jokes. Uh, but in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, he's got his own islands, so that's kind of cool. And in Tears of the Kingdom, you can find, I don't think you can in Breath of the Wild, can't remember, but Tears of the Kingdom, for sure, you can find a Tingle outfit, so you can dress up as Tingle uh, if you'd like. Um, so in terms of other androgynous characters, though, um, I don't know if I'd necessarily call Tingle super androgynous, um, but the Gorons were mentioned in a, in another question that I didn't get to in terms of like, um, kind of like un sort of, I don't know, unconscious queerness or whatever, like, um, they didn't maybe intend, but the Gorons really do seem to also be, um, if not like mono gendered, then, um, also kind of portrayed in this way where, where, um, sort of sex, secondary sex characteristics are not obvious. Uh, and so that's quite interesting. On the, on the flip side, you have the Zora where the female Zora have breasts and you're like, they're fish people. Why did you give them breasts? But okay, um, not all of them. Some of them are, it's more obvious than other. And then you've got the Gerudo who are like aggressively um, sort of feminine in their design, but also large and muscular. Um, but in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, all they care about is finding a man and it's really frustrating. Um, so you have a lot of really interesting and, and sometimes contradictory approaches to, to gender portrayals in this series that does have so much androgyny centralized in it, especially in the form of Link. Um, so again, like I said before, it's, it's one of those things where fans bring to it what they want to bring to it. So if you see yourself in this character, if you see your own identity in this character, it can be really empowering for you unless that character is the butt of jokes, right? And so I think the the joking and the offensive aspects need to be sort of removed. Um, <laughs> maybe not by erasing Tingle altogether, maybe sort of redeeming his character. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity for future installments in the series to really sort of explore gender roles, push back against sort of heteronormativity uh, in exciting ways, because there's a lot of really interesting questions to tease out regarding gender in, in these newer games and throughout the whole series. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, because of the time, um, this is going to be the, today's last question. Um, if anyone knows about this, like uh, fans in Japan. 
So could you talk a bit about how culture plays a role in the reception of the game? For example, would a player in Japan have a different connection to the game? Can I take this one? I'm not a player from Japan, <laughs> um, but I do work with Japanese academics who talk about Legend of Zelda in a really different way uh, to what we do. And um, I did notice a question in the chat when I was talking about the Shonen and the JRPG, I think somebody popped up, wait, is Legend of Zelda a JRPG? Mm -hmm. um, and some people, a lot of people in the West would say, yes, of course it is, and for all these reasons. Um, but in Japan, no, not so much. It's an action game, right? It's an adventure game. And um, some people call it like an ARPG right, like action RPG. And um, I think the main difference is, you know, like in Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, you, you have the menu for battle and you can take a long time and pick, well, I'm going to use magic and then I'm going to do this spell and it's this embedded text boxes, right? But in, you know, Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess or Breath of the Wild, it's direct action input. You're swinging the sword, you're fighting the monster. It's very different when you're doing it yourself. And so in Japan, there is this kind of um, genre distinction, I think. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to point out there, um, uh, uh, Japanese audiences look at um, Zelda and Link and they see Japanese people because they are, yeah, they have blonde hair and uh, blue eyes or whatever, but they look Japanese because they're drawn in the conventions of manga and anime, mm. right? So that the way that a young American player might look at it and the way a young Japanese player look at it might be very, very different. Yeah, just to follow up on that, it's the same with when you're talking about queerness and gender representation and, you know, talking about all of these nuances of masculinity and femininity. Um, again, very much uh, need, need, very much need to take into account the cultural context because certain conversations just aren't happening the same way in Japan as they're happening in the West and vice versa, right? So definitely there are, there are different factors to take into account. I think one thing, if you're sort of thinking about this difference, um, when push comes to shove, deferring to what the developers had to say for their inspiration, because they've talked endlessly about their inspiration for this series. It's like, there's, we have so much like a rich gold mine of like data from developer interviews, commentary and paratextual material, the various guides and art books and whatever. Um, but we can really see what they say they were going for um, in terms of all of these designs and all of these everything. And then we can kind of think about, okay, how does that actually jive? with reception in the West and in the East and, and all over the world, um, taking into account uh, your own sort of perspective um, from, you know, your own subject positionality. So it's it's definitely like, like everything literally ever, it'll be different in one culture versus another. And I think that's like, that's awesome and very exciting to, to explore as scholars and as critics and as fans. That's even something we have to look at um, in my field, like we're cautioned ethically to avoid diagnosis uh, without considering culture. And so I, I just to echo what what's mm. being said. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, but to the question, I just wanted to add like, as a Japanese, like I saw how big it was when the Tears of Kingdom re released this time, like uh, some company even allows employees to get the take like a day off like Zelda annual pay leave. I don't know if it's paid, but a Zelda day of day, um, um, like a, for the release day. It was a, like a huge phenomenon. So like, um, yeah, I just wanted to add it, how big it is for in Japan too. Um, okay, so that's all for today. I'd like to give a big thank yous to our special guest speakers, Matt, Steve, uh, Rachel, Wesley, and Salar for sharing their expertise, and Matt, um, thank you so much for creating such a great script. Um, our next session will be about survival horror games, hopefully in October. For more upcoming information, please subscribe to our channel or check our social media and newsletter links in the description box below. And. Finally, before you go, please fill out a quick survey and tell us what topics you are interested in for a future episode. You can find the link in the description box as well. 
Thank you again for joining us today and hope to see you at the next episode. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Sakya and everybody. Thank you so much. Hope you Thank enjoy. you. Uh...